can we get the apologies? Do we have apologies? Yes, Chair. Uh, the apology of uh, Honorable Mkachwa. Uh, she is writing exams, Jefferson, as well as the apology from the minister. Okay. Those are the apologies. Okay. Uh, all right. You only have those two apologies. I, I haven't seen the apology from the minister. Did you forward it to me? Yes, Jefferson. Okay, I will just have a look at it. All right. Uh, good evening, members, honorable members. Good evening, um, the leadership of the Department of Higher Education and Training, uh, the leadership of uh, Yusuf, uh, Sao, Saus, my apologies, and Safita Working Group. You are all welcome, uh, together with all the officials uh, from Parliament as well as from the Department. Uh, we have decided to schedule the last briefing on, uh, on the plans to save the 2020 academic year, which we think that it's a subject that will feature uh, on our uh, program uh, until we get a sense that uh, all is in order. Uh, but for now, uh, almost in every quarter, we think that we will require a, an engagement with the department, uh, as well as all the other stakeholders, so that we are able to determine where we are. Uh, in line with the principles that has been adopted uh, of leaving no one behind. <clears throat> we must make sure that as we move through towards the end of the this calendar year, uh, all the stakeholders are taken on board in our quest to save the 2020 academic year. Uh, so we will uh, continue to have this kind of interactions with the department and all other stakeholders. So let's start with the meeting. Uh, the DG called earlier on to say that he's struggling uh, to connect, he's at home. So I don't know whether he is connected now, but uh, it looks like uh, the issue is not our IT, the issue is uh, connectivity from where he is. So he may join us later, uh, but I see most of the officials from the department are here. I haven't seen the deputy minister. I know that uh, he's going to be joining us. But yeah, let's start with the meeting <clears throat> and then hand over to the department. If the deputy minister is in the house, uh, he can uh, then introduce the subject and hand over to whoever is going to make a, a technical presentation. Now, maybe just before the, the deputy minister come in, we, we are going to try to manage time as strictly as possible. Uh, we've got about uh, <clears throat> how many presentations from the department? Uh, from Yusuf, from uh, Saus, as well as Safeta. So it's about four. So we have allocated the department 40 minutes, uh, Yusuf 20 minutes, and both uh, Saus and Safeta. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember whether it's 10 or 15, but around there. So we will be very strict. Please uh, try and deal with the most important part, uh, not the general, uh, not vision and mission and all of that. <laughs> okay, can we hand over to the deputy minister? Is he in the house? Oh, it doesn't look like... Uh, Honorable Manamela is in the house. The DG. 
The DG is not in the house. Who's leading the departmental delegation today? Um, Honorable Chair, perhaps um, I should step in um, with the presentation. I was expecting the DG, but he has just SMSed me to tell me that he's having difficulties as well and can't get in. And I'm not sure um, the Deputy Minister, we, we did expect the Deputy Minister to join us, but perhaps when he joins, he can um, make some comments then or, or after the presentation. But with your permission, perhaps we should just start with the, with the presentation from the department. Um, okay. I've noted the 40 minutes. All right. No, it's fine. I think it's in order. But first, let's just establish from the staff of the Deputy Minister whether he's going to join or what. I saw some officials from the office of the Deputy Minister. Is there anybody who can uh, tell us what is the situation with the DM? Chair. Mm. May I come in? Uh, we are still trying to, to, to get the Deputy Minister to join. Apparently they joined the wrong meeting. Okay. All right, let's proceed then. Uh, Dr. Parker, take us through the presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Must I put the, pull the pressure? Uh, can I share the presentation yeah. from my side? Yeah, please do. Okay, I just need to get it up. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Okay, right. great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members, um, oh, it's just gone frozen now. There it comes. Um, I'm going to do, I'll start the presentation with the University Education uh, uh, slides and then I'll hand over to my counterpart in um, uh, TVETS to take us through the TVET slides and the CET slides. Um, just to start off with then, with the university education issues, um, we, okay, um, we, we, what we will we'll just report on briefly is our process towards the 2020 academic um, year and the key principles behind it, which I think we all have agreed to is that we have to save lives, save the academic year, and maximize opportunities for success. And this le links directly to your comment about ensuring that we take all students along with us and ensure they have a fair chance of, of succeeding. Um, we've adopted a, re a risk adjusted strategy in the system, as you're aware, um, through the different levels of the, um, of the strategy. Um, and the, in, in the university education system, we're talking about having developed three different um, focuses. The one is in terms of the multimodal teaching and learning plans. And these take us through the entire spectrum from um, remote learning through to contact learning towards the end of the year. Secondly, everybody has developed campus readiness plans to look at health and safety and third year and thirdly, um, all institutions have plans for the phased return of staff and students. Mm -hmm. I'm not able to, in this presentation, give you the details of all these plans, but what I can say is that every university has plans in place and we worked through costings of these plans as well. The department has put together um, something called the COVID-19 Responsiveness Grant to support um, institutions. This is, comes from reprioritized funds. As we know, there, uh, there is a major uh, uh, problem in terms of the fiscus, but we've um, worked together to identify funds that could be approved for reprioritization to support this. The first, first grant has already been supported and all institutions are implementing their plans accordingly. If we understand um, how we think about this, as we decrease the uh, lockdown levels, so we move from remote 
types of teaching and learning through to contact teaching and learning. But what we know about the virus is that at every point, we have to be concerned about health and safety, that we have to be thinking about um, physical distancing and social solidarity. And for that reason, even when 100% um, of the students are back in level one, we're probably still going to see a large amount of blended learning um, rather than the kind of large class learning that we used to uh, were used to. The department, the minister has gazetted um, a gazette on the criteria for the return of students to campuses, which is published on the 8th of June. And all institutions have been planning in relation to that to bring back the first 33% of students from the 17th of June. Each institution has its own plan in terms of the dates on when different groups of students are returning. And I think the important issue here is that every institution has um, planned accordingly, is in contact with their students to inform them and is providing them with the um, specific uh, permits to travel. Um, so far from all the institutions, we've received 22 of the um, return to campus plans. And of those, two in three institutions asked for deviations from the um, criteria. One um, we did not approve and the other two we did approve. Um, but generally all institutions are managing their processes accordingly from health and safety and from teaching and learning perspectives. Um, just in terms of the multimodal, what we're talking about is a different mix of different teaching and learning strategies across the system. Every institution has a clear multimodal plan that has now been costed and the minister has approved um, a COVID responsiveness grant for each one. Some institutions are almost all working um, all together on print-based teaching and learning methods, whereas others are going towards- I can't hear, um, Chair, I don't know if others can hear. Well, I can hear. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe let's just check with all the members. Are you able to follow? Yes, no, okay. no, some of us who can't hear anything. I thought it was my the problem of my device chair. So I realized that others are having similar problems. Okay, let's just check. Uh, is Honorable Gieti, Honorable Boshoff, and who else? Honorable uh, Bozoli, sorry. Yeah, who else? I clearly. Can you follow? Honorable Manani, sorry. Honorable Mananiso, Chair. Yeah. Can you follow? Honorable Mananiso. Just, just mute your mics after speaking. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so it's only Honorable Pozoli and Honorable Gates who are not able to follow. Uh, can I suggest that you you leave the meeting and uh, join back immediately? Maybe that would be better. And as you join back, join with audio or whatever it. Uh, these things can be very tricky, you know. Can we do that, uh, Honorable Pozole and Gates? Okay. Okay. Um, all right, if there is a persistent problem, I think we will have to interrupt. But for now, let's allow uh, Dr. Parker to proceed. Th thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, so this slide is really just illustrative um, that every institution has a different mix of different types of ways in which they have been supporting students um, over the, this period of lockdown. And um, I'm sure this will continue into the period of uh, as, as students start um, coming back as well. Um, this next slide is focused on. Um, is, is focused on the next slot, which is campus readiness plans and um, that's focusing really on health and safety specifically. 
Um, and here, all universities have also developed plans. Higher Health has very helpfully helped us adv with advice um, for institutions. And we've identified the specific aspects that can be supported by the department. We are busy in a process with the minister to get approval for a further reprioritization of earmark grants to assist institutions to ensure that they can um, be supported in these areas. I won't go through all those details. You have it in front of you. Um, in terms of the criteria for the return to campus, um, we've published in, them in the Gazette. And really, I think the most important thing here is that all institutions really have to put in place these various aspects that are in the Gazette. As I said, we've got plans from um, 21 of the institutions, 22 of the institutions so far. We've been promised that the others will come in in the next few, um, the next day. Um, and uh, the main thing is that everybody has, so far as we've analyzed it, put in place the health and safety protocols, have um, dealt with the issues of the um, campus, the, the, the health checks are um, meeting the various criteria in terms of the, the various aspects that need to be put in place. And, um, you know, I suppose you can get more details from specific institutions. We haven't been able to here give all the details. Um, in terms of the return to campus, it's a risk adjusted strategy. So in the level five, only clinical uh, training students return to final years. Um, and as we've moved into level four, um, sorry, the level four, the, the, the final year medical um, students returned. Um, and level three, um, the students have started returning from the 17th of June at some of our institutions. As I'd indicated, it's a phased in approach, so there are different dates for each institution. Institutions have provided those dates and those details. In terms of um, the main issues are the groups of students who would be returning. And as I've indicated, only two institutions have asked for deviations from this. Um, the, we're talking here mainly about our public institutions. But this is also applicable to private higher education institutions. And so far, um, yesterday was the date that the, the, the private hires had to submit their plans by. We've already got around about 80 of those plans in out of the 136. Um, and there we are also looking at a similar process with approving deviations if they fit within the 33% process. Um, in terms of uh, the next levels, we will be returning different groups of students according to the strategy as these are announced by national government, um, waiting for a two week um, space between them. It will only be at level two that we will be returning all students. Um, but as I'd indicated, the protocols will still have to be in place social solidarity remains a major issue because we're all in this together and everybody has to take their uh, particular part in ensuring that the health and safety of everybody else um a key issue is the return of international students who've been out of the country during this period um in terms of the support programs that have been provided to students um uh, particularly in the multimodal uh, period um, all our students, in fact, are getting uh, data through the institutions to support um, multimodal uh, teaching and learning, specifically NISFAS students. Um, and then, of course, the NISFAS students have been receiving their living allowances, their transport allowances, and they are being supported with digital devices. So far, um, our, our indication is that there are only nine institutions which weren't able to procure um, previously. And so there are nine institutions that will still be procuring, um, uh, utilizing the central process through NISFAS. Um, um, in terms of the academic year fees, this is another issue that we've been thinking about. Um, obviously, the different scenarios 
um, uh, do result in a flexibility built in with different groups. And so this uh, returning to, to, to um, uh, campuses by the various institutions in a staggered way means that we are going to be going into the 2021 calendar year to complete the um, uh, academic year. We are hoping optimistically that we should be finished by the end, um, mid-March at the latest, but the worst case uh, scenario planning is to take us through to April. Um, this, of course, has a knock-on effect into the next academic year, which is likely to be compressed. We are making a proposal for a national framework, and this is now um, being discussed through University of South Africa and with the private, private hire, um, housing associations to ensure that we can find a way to um, deal with some of the financial pressure linked to the, the process. And the basic proposal is that we agree that the fee for the academic year whether it's the academic year fee or the um, accommodation fees should stay the same, no matter what the length of that um, is. And this will assist us in terms of dealing with the, the issues. Um, lastly, the issue of the NISFAS um, funding for student allowances, we are, we will get, as we, as we understand better how we'll deal with it, we'll be modeling that because we're going to have to continue the allowances for students who are still going to be there for an extended period. Um, however, if we get the fee agreements in place, that will help um, with limiting the costs. Um, the issue of the, the learning devices, I think NISFAS um, is here, so that uh, NISFAS will be dealing with those. Um, and as I, as I indicated already, the, some institutions have already procured those devices, but the rest will be done centrally through NISFAS. Um, the institutions, um, I think at, at, the, at the institutional level, there's a process in place to deal with the, um, the funding because this funding for the devices comes from the um, uh, allowances for learning materials from, in, from students. In terms of other issues, um, we've had a number of gazettes that have been put in, in line um, and we're looking at uh, a number of different um, aspects. The minister and the deputy minister are visiting campuses to check on the res readiness. They've already been to a number of different institutions um, and in general we've found that the institutions are um, adhering to all the protocols um, and are... are um, uh, meeting the, 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 the expectations, I think the, um, you know, with a, with a very few exceptions. Um, Higher Health has been providing extensive support to our institutions in terms of guidelines and protocols and advice and also through training and support to all our staff and students and this has been very helpful. I think we are very grateful to have um, Higher Health uh, working with us across the whole system not only university education. And then lastly, um, we've developed a monitoring tool which has gone out to all institutions and that will be administered every two weeks to update on the readiness and the implementation in terms of the different plans. Um, institutions are expected to uh, submit the first report this Friday and thereafter we will be getting uh, bi-weekly, bi-monthly reports that we'll be able to give to the minister in terms of this, uh, these aspects. That brings me to the end of the um, university presentation. I'm going to hand over to um, Ms. Singh, our deputy, acting deputy director for, um, for TBETS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parker. And uh, Dr. Parker, may I beg your indulgence to help me through the presentation that you have on screen? Just to go through the slides, there aren't too many. Um, good evening to the Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Um, I will go through the slides. It's a short presentation and I will try to, um, you know, go through it as quickly as possible as indicated by the Chair. Um, in the first slide, what, what we have here is just a snapshot 
of the return of students to campuses. This is following the lockdown as the different cohorts of students return to campuses. The first return was the trimester students. The reason there's a period there, if we look at the column of returning students, is that they returned in different groupings. Um, like the N3 and N6 came together on the 10th, and then it was the N5 and N2, N, um, and then the N4 and N1. So, you know, we they, it is extremely staggered. Uh, the same with the semester students. They are only due back from tomorrow, which means up to now semester students have not been on any of the campuses. And NCV students will not be back until July. So we can see the last grouping of the NCV students, uh, levels two and three actually only get back at the end of July. Level three on the 20th and level two on the 27th of July. So they have a full month still to go before they, they return to campus. Um, what it means for the academic year is that we will not be able to accommodate trimester three in 2020. That will have to spill over into next year. Uh, the same with semester two. Uh, we really would have liked to have accommodated semester two this year, but when we took into account the exams, and the exams also have to be staggered to provide for social distancing and so forth, it was really not possible. So even semester two uh, will go out into next year. Um, in terms of the, as I said, the national exams will take into account different sessions to be written to accommodate social distancing. And the whole academic calendar, which I made available with the, when I sent the briefing notes for the rest of the year, the end of the year examinations and the second half of the year, the return of students for the second trimester and so forth, are in absolute detail in the academic calendar that has been signed off and it was shared with all stakeholders and colleges have it from the end of May thus far. Uh, Chair, the next um, slide simply shows us the, uh, the status as at this week. Because the return of students has been so staggered, as at last week, um, by the 19th of June, we only had about 53% of the campuses open because of the way the, the offerings are distributed in the colleges. But by tomorrow, the 25th of June, we can see 234 campuses, but that means 93% of our campuses will be open and just 17% will still be closed. And based on what I just said just now, one can assume that all of those are for NCV students exclusively. I mean, obviously other, other campuses would share programs um, uh, across qualifications, therefore they would have been open. So, I mean, the, the slide is quite uh, self-explanatory. I'm not going to go into too much of it, but I think the distribution of the campuses is important. Uh, if we move to the next slide, the protocols that we have put into place for the return of students, um, obviously the, the, the compulsory one is daily screening at all sites for both staff and students. Um, higher health, even in the colleges, have played a remarkable role. They have trained staff virtually long before the colleges actually opened. And uh, the Health Check app is what has been widely used because students can access it on their cell phones. But for those who can't, there is still the manual process to do the screening. Uh, sanitizers, of course, standard practice. Student packs, colleges have gone the route, the bulk of them, uh, to actually prepare student packs. When students came back to colleges, um, a lot of the colleges uh, handed them out um, student packs in which they had their masks and soap and whatever else that they needed to have um, to protect them whilst they were on campus. Uh, in terms of classes, classes um, had to be split into two. Uh, and, you know, uh, colleges were asked to timetable how they would accommodate each half. They could work on a morning, afternoon timetable or alternate days as well, where one day the, the students would be in face to face learning support. Um, uh, and, and on the alternate days, they would be in self study, guided self study. The emphasis, it's clear, has to be on practical learning because 
um, practical learning and given that this is vocational students cannot be accommodated through any form of remote learning it, it, it it's just not tenable irrespective of how you try to do it and um, the important thing is given that we run national exams um, and not institutional institutional examinations the credibility of site-based assessments the assessments conducted by the colleges themselves which we commonly call the ICAS has to be protected and we've just issued a circular in in that regard this week on the requirements in that regard if we move to the next slide um, this is where the real um, readiness tracking has been done what we had done um, is developed a checklist made up of about 40 items and that checklist drew on the department of health and the higher health pro protocols and guidelines and um, those were divided into five key categories of readiness and you can see them there it's communication COVID-19 cases which means how one would communication is really about how would the college how has the college communicated with internal and external stakeholders around a great number of issues including um, the return of students managing the learning environment the protocols in place and so forth the COVID-19 cases is perhaps the most important of these categories. It asks questions around whether there's a steering committee in place, what the reporting mechanisms are, whether what are the provisions for quarantine, self-isolation and the whole referral system. It was very intensive, um, the questions around uh, that in that particular category. Occupational health and safety was about the measures we have been talking about, sanitization, wearing of masks, how uh, social distancing would be accommodated and so forth. Operational um, was a whole lot of things, how um, the budgets would be readjusted, how staff would be reallocated, how um, um, the spaces would be used, how classrooms would be rearranged and all of those kinds of things. And teaching and learning was around the curriculum area, including what remote learning was put in place to support students. So that very, very briefly is an indication of the five categories that we had on the checklist. And this was, it's, it's a self-assessment tool and it was administered on a weekly basis to all 50 colleges and the colleges had to report per campus. So each week we collected this information that provided us with the status um, in each of the campuses actually. So it covered about 270 campuses. And um, we, we had this conducted this week would have been the fifth week that we have tracked um, the, um, the responses of colleges through the checklist. And what you see on the screen now, uh, if we could go still to the previous one, Dai, what we see on the screen in this, in, in the, in this one is the national categories as at 19th June. So that was last Friday. And this is the status nationally which means 99.8% of the colleges uh, indicated that all the communication measures were in place and um, the rest of the categories, COVID-19 cases, 97.5, and so it goes on. So the reporting by last week shows a very high level of, of readiness overall. 60% um, by that time had already scored 100%. And that's probably attributable to the fact that 17 campuses still have to open. Uh, thanks, Di. We can go to the next one. I'm not going to explain this one. It's just for the interest, if members have a particular interest, to see how the various provinces had fared in each of the categories. Some of them have done better in some categories than in other categories. We can see that communication is the one area where they all scored uh, very well. Um, about 100%, but it varies thereafter in terms of the other categories. Um, I, I will not go into detail. What, what I really um, focus on is the next slide that actually ranks the colleges because it shows you all those that achieved absolutely 100% by last week, the 19th of June, and um, uh, a good bit of them above 90 the only one that is that fell below the 90 mark overall is Ingwe Tibet College, and they had a whole host of problems. 
um, that were not necessarily about their own efforts at readiness. Some of it was, which we dealt with. That was the easier thing to, to deal with. But the college had um, had a lot of uh, challenges from the community when the cleaners and so forth, hired cleaners were on site. The community had breached the boundary uh, for two reasons. One is to get water from the borehole. The second was to um, demand con contractual work um, and uh, so forth. But anyway, those have been dealt with and the college um, had scheduled to open this week on Monday. But you will see in the slides as we go through the challenges that as colleges open and cases come up, positive cases, they are, uh, you know, shutting down again. If we move to the next slide, Dai, um, in terms of the online learning support initiatives in place, uh, the slide is actually quite self-explanatory. I don't think I want to really go into it. Uh, we've spoken about zero rated websites, even for the universities, and how students are able to access materials, um, how e-guides have been made available by publishers and so forth. That was from April. And very importantly, our national open learning system has been um, uh, quite instrumental in assisting with uploading national examination question papers, which students use a lot in the preparation for their national examinations and so forth. Even in normal teaching, when students are in class, this um, is used a lot. So all of this was done quite early on in April, so students could you know, navigate through their learning. Sli the next slide is also pretty self-explanatory. It um, shows the other learning support initiatives that have been in place, and it also started out around April um, uh, with um, television broadcasts that have grown. The only point to make here, I would say, is that uh, the television broadcasts were mainly on DSTV, How TV, and that is because they, they were more affordable for the colleges. The negotiations with SABC are continuing, but when colleges had engaged them individually and then collectively, it was still extremely, extremely, extremely expensive to run the televised um, lessons on the SABC. But this is something our communications unit is looking at going into the future beyond COVID because it's something that we would like to continue with. Um, but what, what we do is we take the recordings of the um, televised lessons and they are uploaded on the www.tvetcolleges.co.za website um, hosted in the department. So colleges have easy access to it. It is zero rated. They can download it at any time and it uh, makes for wider usage, both by lecturers and, and by students. The radio lessons are, are similar. Initially, it started just in Mpumalanga, but subsequently other colleges have also uh, secured slots with their local radio stations. So that has also grown uh, steadily over the last two to three months. But the point of emphasis is that uh, stu all students in TVET colleges get um, textbooks and that remains the most valuable tool for students to navigate through their learning and it reaches every student. So simply put, if a student truly wants to study, really is prepared to commit a few hours per day to study through the curriculum, the textbooks are incredibly valuable because we evaluate them, we approve them, we put them into a catalog, they have a lot of practical exercises, they have assessment exercises and so forth. So that has remained for us a key driver of how we would support students remotely. Um, and lecturers have used bulk SMSs, WhatsApp groups and so forth to support these students. Just on the last slide, Chair, um, this is certainly not a full list. It's far from a full list, but I thought it's important to flag some of the changes in as much as the students are back and classes are there and we know the minister and deputy minister have been out and about, um, the, the feedback has been in the main very positive, but there is a great deal of instability at the moment. Colleges just open and then there are positive cases or, or high risk cases and then they have to shut down 
and then this whole cycle of decontamination and so forth has to take place. So apart from the operational instability, the complaint we are getting now is that it's an incredibly expensive exercise for the colleges. They, the allocations that they had um, you know, set aside for, to deal with COVID-19 related issues has been literally spent at this stage. The other challenge is around the comorbidities, you know, the staff over 60 and so forth. Part of it is real, which means there they really are staff, you know, who, who fall into this category, who are well over 60 and who have very specific conditions, who shouldn't be at work. And how do we plug those gaps in the learning space is something that colleges are struggling to deal with because it could uh, incur exorbitant costs to find replacements. But over and above that, we are getting, you know, um, some staff who are just uh, seeing this as a means of getting some isolation time off. Uh, to say, you know, the, the other day I was in contact with a person who was positive and, you know, now I need to go into self-isolation. The positive cases are easy. They are the ones you can track and the evidence is there through the testing. But uh, the ones who say they have been in contact with somebody who is positive, those are the tricky ones. And it's really on the increase. And I think it's causing a lot of frustration. Finally, the students have come to campuses, but many of them um, were resistant when they found that they didn't get their laptops on the first day when they returned. And it's, you know, it's what I call the culture of demand is not helpful because we did not premise the completion of the academic year in the TVET system on the use of devices. We didn't. We really premised it on those things that are very accessible and students uh, can actually use and returning to campus. Uh, we, we always made provision for the fact that students would always have some level of face-to-face -face learning before they wrote their examinations and before they were assessed. And also not all students would get devices. So that is that remains a challenge, but no. colleges are no. changing it. Yeah. Uh, that was the last slide, Chair. Okay, thank you. The last thank presentation. You. Dr. Mflobo? Yeah, I also will need your help. Can you just move through the slides, please? Okay, Aruna took more of your time. You are left with about six minutes now. Uh, blame uh, the Tibet branch. So hopefully you'll uh, do it in the next six minutes. Uh, that's why, right, Chair, uh, next, next, next time. I'm going to ask Chair to give the CET branch to present separately from the other two branches in order to have time. But I will try my luck. And next, time we'll start. Yeah, next time we'll start with you. Uh, Chair and members uh, and colleagues, you will recall that uh, the Minister made this announcement on the media statement of 23rd April uh, that uh, the return to to campus subject to readiness to centers would be 25 for management, uh, first June for center managers, and uh, eight, eight, eight for lecturers, and 17th for students who are registered in those qualifications. And also the presupposition and the premise which we still cling to is that we align our academic program with that of the DPE because of infrastructure. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, we also had indicated to the to the members that on those days, that those are the activities that the colleges will be doing on the 23rd, on the 25th, and on the 27th in preparation for the opening at the, at the beginning of July. Uh, however, ne next slide. Uh, the monitoring of whether or not the colleges have, have, have been doing this, uh, we were presenting to the task team, we're meeting with regional managers and college management and also college councils because if you don't meet with college councils and this is where 
the reprioritization of the college budget has got to be approved, and therefore we have to consult, we have to meet with them and show them the need for college budget reprioritization. Next. Next slide. Uh, like my colleagues in Tibet has indicated, we, we developed a questionnaire which was based on the checklist, uh, which was developed by NICD and Higher Health, and it was measured in those areas which Aruna, that is missing, has adequ adequately explained. The next slide. Uh, at the beginning, as at uh, 29 May, this is how bad the situation was in terms of readiness. And at that point, we then advised the minister to say that you know what the system is not the system is not ready. We can't say the colleges must open, and yet the basic education system is not operational because. Those are the sites which we must in inspect and see the extent to which they are ready, they are compliant with the regulation. That was the first initial uh, assessment in terms of those categories. Next. And uh, this, th this was then the days which the minister announced in the statement of that, that year, uh, I think, 30th of May. These are the new dates uh, which the minister announced that uh, the management, center managers, and lecturers, and the students in the lower level, they will come back on those dates back to the campus, to the centers. And the, the centers opened, who are doing those qualifications, they opened on the, 20, on the 23rd already. We're just getting a report in terms of progress. Uh, the rationale for extension, as I've already indicated, it was to complete the compliance with COVID-19, to deal with people with, who have 60 years of age and over, and to deal with people with comorbidities, to finalize procurement and delivery and distribution of material, and by higher health to finalize the training of center managers, as well as to identify those centers which the DBE has not opened because they had no sanitation and they were dilapidated, they were a risk to go to send our students back there. Uh, the next slide. Uh, I think by the by last week, by the 19th, this was the state of readiness of uh, CET colleges and which gave us uh, confidence that if they, if they do open some of the challenges that crop up, they may be able to, to manage while they were already inside, except the issues that I'm listing at, at the end, that they are still more likely to be the responsibility of the department. Next slide. Uh, this I also would not want to go to. Uh, if members are interested, we'll have, we'll have a look at the college. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the colleges, when you compare all of them, this slide excludes Mpumalanga. Mpumalanga CET College data was not captured, but by, but by last week, Mpumalanga was already at 87% readiness. And the only college which is of concern was uh, Northwest. At Northwest, it largely had hit by issues of sanitation and issues which uh, relate to infrastructure and the, uh, as well as pollution facilities. And that is the college at the moment we are paying attention to together with the management and the council of the college. The next slide. Uh, that is basically the national average in terms of the readiness to go back to class. The next slide. Now, this, this, this will be my last slide, Chair. 
uh, we have to issue the uh, revised academic calendar based on the Gazette published by the Department of Higher Education, the Department of Basic Education. Uh, we have to support institutions to deal with people who are 60 years and above in terms of the, and this must be an employer directive because the, the, the staff is not employed by colleges. And we also have to deal with the issue, what do we do with people who can't work distantly uh, because largely they are, they, they are teachers and also the, tech, the requisite skills for technology are not there and they have uh, uncontrolled comorbidities. And we have to do with the, what do we do with those centers we, which are, were located in the dilapidated school where there is no water sanitation and where the province has issued a directive that the centers must not be accommodated because of the issues of cleaning. Uh, we have to do with the appointment of cleaners, the screeners. Uh, there are frequent temporary closures of schools where we are located due to vandalism and in some instances, in some instances due to detection of new infections of learning sites. Uh, I don't think the rest of the system, when everybody comes back to class, we have quantified what would be the implication of 1.5 meter uh, physical physical distancing because in some instances for one class if you are doing shifts uh, you can but in this case we have a problem where the schools are platooning and therefore it means we have no time even to come we have we have no time even to come in and uh, also the financing and funding implications for the employer just uh, finally chair when you look at the nature of our sectors, uh, this is this is actually what one sector which uh, where the levels of inequality of system become more pronounced, and it doesn't look like a sector which belongs to South Africa. It's, it's, it's like a sector which we might have just picked up from somewhere and we brought it here because of the levels of neglect and uh, just. Whatever you want to try, you are likely going to bump into a problem if there is no investment in this sector. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Although you, you defied the six minutes that you had and uh, proceeded, but it's fine. Uh, we, can, we can pardon you for that. Uh, the DM is in the house, uh, so can we just request uh, Deputy Minister Manamela just to say some few comments before we hand over to Yusuf. Uh, DM, apparently you had some uh, connectivity issues, but now you, you, are, you are connected. We're still struggling. There we are. Thank you, thank you, Chair. We, we ended up going to uh, a different meeting. I think we were given. Uh, let me just try and do this. We were given a, um, a link to to a different meeting, which uh, and where we sat in there for a while with a couple of. Uh, the uh, the colleagues here so that's why we then had to rejoin in uh, a bit later on um and uh, i just got in as uh, as honorable i mean as as uh, 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 ddg parker was doing her presentation but i just want to i mean the idea was obviously that we will just make some few uh, remarks just before the uh, DDGs makes the the presentations, and 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 maybe just to take uh, colleagues through that. Firstly, I think we can gather from the presentation that uh, a couple of institutions have now reopened um, through the uh, 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 risk adjusted 
uh, phased in approach of the reopening of, uh, of our institutions and that um, there has been uh, a minimum incident in terms of the cases that have been uh, reported and thirdly that uh, a lot has been done by institutions by the department in ensuring that we uh, ready all the institutions to be able to welcome uh, students we have uh, physically gone to some of the institutions uh, together with the minister to ensure that uh, you know there is institutional readiness there's obviously been some uh, challenges uh, some challenges includes the fact that uh, some of the uh, institutions had to do a uh, final push-up, uh, including uh, cleaning of the campus facilities, uh, include, uh, you know, finalizing support that they need to get to students and a whole range of other interventions. But I think in the overall, the uh, sense that we have is that uh, most institutions uh, have been able to uh, you know meet up with the challenge of ensuring that they reopen uh, but other than that i think the the uh, the details have been uh, uh, you know provided and what we'll do is that we'll listen to, to the questions and then respond to those thank you very much uh, chairperson okay thank you very much uh, dm um can we then move to uh to yourself. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chairperson um, of the committee uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I, I hope that my presentation can be seen. Uh, not yet. It's not showing yet. Yes. Sorry, Chair. Are you alone or are you with a delegation? I'm, I am chair uh, with um, uh, Professor Bauer, the CEO of USAF. I am uh, with uh, the ex-co of USAF, uh, a number of VCs, I think six of them. Uh, they are in the room uh, also with us, chair. Okay, just quickly introduce them. Uh, we have um, uh, Professor Bauer, the CEO of USA, who, uh, whom I'm sure you know very well. Uh, Professor uh, Diaka uh, um, <coughs> from uh, CUT. Professor Devilias. Uh, I don't know if Professor Devilias is here. I've not seen him, but I've seen Professor Mabizela from Rhodes. Um, Professor Makanya from UNISA. Uh, am I leaving anyone out? I think I've, those are the colleagues that I've seen. Professor, uh, Professor Cooper is with us. Professor Cooper from Pretoria. From University of Pretoria. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, proceed. You're still struggling sharing the, your presentation. I'm trying to do that, Chair. Is it showing now? Yeah, just click on it uh, so that it can open. Uh, your screen is showing. Go to this It's not showing. Don't know yeah, it's showing. It's showing now. No, not yet. Professor uh, Mutua, perhaps just open the file before you try to share it, I think. Okay, open the file first. Yeah, just go to your documents, open it, and then share it after. I think that will do. Uh, Anela, do you have a copy of uh, USAF presentation? Yes, sir. yes, a copy has been sent to Anela, yes. Yes, sir. Okay, are you able to uh, share it with us? Oh, okay, sir. <clears throat> Uh, 
Uh, are you able to see, Jay? Yeah, just open it. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, just put the slideshow there. You can see it. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Anela, are you able to? Hi, Anela. Sorry, Chair. Uh, could you just press F5? It will go into full screen. Okay. F5. Yes. Is it right? Yeah, that's, that's yes. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can see it now. Okay, Chair, proceed. Thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, is someone pressing for me? Yes. And then I will control it for you. Yeah, just talk to the slides. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair uh, and um, my colleagues. Uh, I, I just want to say, Chair, I want to start by saying that um, we have, uh, our presentation has got many overlaps with that of the Department of uh, 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 educa Higher Education, particularly uh, the presentation that Professor Dr. Parker presented, because uh, we've been working very closely together. So that is the outline uh, of the presentation there. What we are going to do, though, is to hone in on the things that perhaps needs more uh, emphasis and not repeat uh, uh, what uh, uh, word for word what Dr. Parker has said uh, already. Can we go to the next slide? Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, can we have the next one? Uh, just to, as a way of introduction, uh, I'm sure you'll recall that uh, um, in mid-March, our universities uh, started to close. Uh, can we have the previous slide, please? Universities uh, started to close uh, after a case was discovered at two of our universities. When the lockdown started on the 23rd of March, um, you are moving too fast. Anele, you have to listen uh, so that you can see where she's, uh, which slide she's speaking to. Uh, Anele, the previous one, it's 1.1. 1 .1. The previous one, please. Thank okay, you. Anele, you must be on 1.1, and then when she says next slide, then go to next slide. Now you are on 1.2, she, she's still on 1.1. Okay. Yes, uh, thanks, That's Chair. Delaying us now, just... Yeah. Okay, uh, proceed. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and then um, we, there has been significant collaboration between the DHET and ourselves, as uh, I have said. So you'll find that there, there are um, overlaps in the material that we're presenting. Uh, we had then, uh, after uh, the closure, begin to think about alternative models uh, of, of delivering our material uh, and the need to embark on uh, emergency teaching and a significant repurposing of research and innovation to support the COVID-19 uh, uh, um, pandemic. Uh, can we go to the next slide? 2.2. Um, when the president announced uh, the, the <clears throat> Uh, Anele is not listening to, to yourself, or maybe uh, I don't know what's happening there. Um, uh, Anele, it's 1.2. Okay. Oh, she, uh, said, she said 2.2. 2. 
I'm, go I'm on 1.2. I'm going to speak to the slides that uh, I have, but I will name them so that uh, Anele can then adjust. Thanks, Chair. Uh, um, I'm going to go to, um, I'm on 1.2, uh, at the beginning of the National uh, State of Disaster, um, we assisted students to leave universities, and then appro approximately 6,000 students uh, remained in residences across all our university sector. All international travel was stopped, only essential domestic travel was permitted, each institution was required to put in place a communication strategy. University health and sev health services and clinics began preparations to deal with COVID-19 cases. Uh, just in the interest of time, Chair, I'm going to skip uh, uh, guiding principles, uh, which is the next slide, and then go to number three, which is uh, working collectively. Uh, I'm on 3.1 now, Anele. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have worked collectively uh, with uh, the, the department and uh, it was uh, said earlier on that uh, we are participating in the PSET COVID-19 response a, a team uh, which is chaired, the MTT, which is chaired by Deputy Minister Manamela. Uh, I'm sure the minister will uh, uh, talk to that. Uh, regular meetings are being held by us with DHET, D CHE, DSI, NRF, and the epidemiologists. Universities are working with the local health departments in the places where they are. We are working closely with the NICD, the National Department of Health, and higher health, as it has been mentioned, uh, and there is active intra-sector engagement through USAF. And all universities uh, have communication strategies in place to uh, um, um, uh, communicate with their uh, publics. I'm moving now to 3.2. Um, uh, all universities, and I think Di mentioned this, that uh, all universities have uh, created their COVID-19 response teams at an institution, uh, institutional level. These include staff and students, and there is continuous engagement with organized labor uh, regarding HR adjustments. And uh, there is engagements uh, with DHET, uh, and I uh, elaborated on this uh, to establish the capacity of our institutions to offer alternative learning and to assess support that each institution needs. And um, we are engaging on uh, to arrive on the agreement on how to complete the academic year 2020 and to address the way in which NASFAS and subsidy funding would work going forward. Uh, I have to say that engagement with the ministerial task team has uh, put forward uh, the deep inequalities that uh, are a feature of our institutions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm on a slide, uh, uh, item 4.1. Uh, Di did speak to the pathways. We have got put, uh, multiple pathways in place. Uh, to complete the annual, the, the academic year 2020. Uh, as we have said, the higher education landscape remains uneven with systemic inequalities requiring, requiring a multi-track approach to the completion of the academic year. While face-to-face -face teaching is constrained during the lockdown, different forms of alternative teaching and learning uh, are being rolled out. And the the academic year 2020 will be reconstituted uh, by universities to ensure that all students have a fair chance to, uh, through face-to-face -face learning and blended learning to complete the academic year. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, in terms of preparation now that uh, we are uh, preparing for the phase return, uh, I want to uh, uh, point out at three approaches. Uh, the multimodal learning during the lockdown has been continuing and it will continue even when we come back. I'm going to come back to that uh, just later on. 
And then uh, the preparation of our campuses for phased return of students is underway. Uh, phased in return of students uh, will depend on the level of the, of the lockdown. I'm going to sleep, uh, uh, sp uh, uh, skip uh, 4.3 because it has been mentioned uh, by uh, the department. Uh, on, uh, with regards to um, issues of inequality uh, that we are facing, which is actually the biggest feature of the problem that we are dealing with uh, between institutions and within institutions, uh, in terms of uh, challenges uh, that institutions are facing, is the uneven IT platforms that we have, the uneven uh, learning management systems that we have, according to the, 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 I suppose, the histories and the capabilities of each campus, of each institution, uneven staff capacity, the issues relating to resources. With regard to student challenges, uh, access to devices is uneven, uh, data and connectivity challenges, uh, the home environments that uh, are not conducive uh, for studying, uh, the uh, preparedness of for online home learning uh, is uneven for our students, depending on the conditions that they find themselves in. But what also we've seen is that uh, there's an upset of psychosocial pressures and problems that students uh, are displaying. And then next slide. Uh, in, in order to mitigate these problems, uh, mechanisms have been created by the DHET via NASFAS uh, uh, for NASFAS students. And uh, Dai uh, had a, a big slide on this, so I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, universities, many of the universities have uh, created the loan systems for other students, uh, uh, including the missing middle students who do not have devices. Uh, some of the universities have been able to procure data for students. We do have to mention, though, that this is unsustainable because uh, uh, this uh, exercise is proving to be costing millions per month uh, for institutions. NASFA students will be covered by DHET through a deal with the uh, uh, mobile network operators. And then now the plan is that vulnerable students will return to residences at the earliest point to ensure access to internet, to devices, and support uh, to engage in blended learning. Additional interventions, uh, some universities have opted for a materials-based in intervention um, involving the delivery to students of paper-based material. I'm on item 4.7 now. These have already been distributed. Uh, I'm on 4.8. During the lockdown level four, the return of final year health students uh, uh, was allowed so that they can engage in clinical training. Preparations for the shift to level three, particularly with regard to public health interventions is, un is underway. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Parker mentioned this consolidating the multimodal learning platforms which have been presented to DHGT and for which funding has been repurposed, as Dr. Parker has already mentioned. Uh, I'm on 4.9. Uh, uh, in terms of level three, as a uh, honorable chair, you would have heard that uh, one third of students are allowed to return uh, by the 14th, uh, uh, from the 14th of June, as it has been said, students have been returning from the 17th of June. Also in the residences, we have been asked to only accommodate one third uh, of students. Universities have prepared for safe reintroduction of students to campuses and of staff. DHET guidelines have been followed. Students who can study from home are being encouraged to do so so as to increase the space, uh, to avail the space for vulnerable students that have to return to residences and facilities sooner because they cannot study at home. On campus, there will be an uh, emphasis on technology-based blended learning uh, so that we promote social distancing, except for e experimental courses and those that need clinical training. Uh, and then uh, in terms of the phased return under level three, 
Uh, it has been determined by the, de the department, uh, I'm on 4.10, that students in the final year of study will return first, students that require access to laboratories, students in all years who must do clinical training, postgraduate students who require access to laboratories and specialized equipment. Universities may also bring back students that are experiencing difficulties at home, as I've mentioned. Uh, in addition, uh, as Di mentioned, universities are allowed to request a deviation or to add categories of students, and some universities have done that. And then I'm on uh, item 5.2, when we talk uh, to the public health responses that the universities are engaging. Universities have all performed health and safety risk analysis in their campuses. They've developed their own guidelines uh, and they have also um, used the guidelines that have been given by Higher Health, the NICD and the National Department of Health. Uh, the use of the HET checklist uh, to ensure that all necessary steps have been taken. Uh, universities, as Dai has said, that uh, were being expected to produce a, a, a regular updates uh, on how we are doing uh, as, as compliance is expected of us. And uh, the department has uh, put some principles in terms uh, of their guidelines, which we are also observing that interventions by universities must be evidence-based, interventions must center human rights and equity, and emphasize social solidarity. They must be responsive, dynamic to changing conditions. We must be accountable to stakeholders and interventions must be sustainable. I'm on uh, 5.3. Uh, the actions required, chair, which I'm not going to list because all sectors of our society are expected to engage with these solutions that have to do with regular screening, social distancing, cough etiquette, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that, but it's part of the compliance um, framework that we are all uh, engaging with. I'm on 5.4. Uh, what steps have been taken? Uh, as I've said, that uh, we're engaging with the local departments of health. The DHET checklist has been worked through. Uh, universities have procured uh, uh, materials that are required. Uh, there has been a, a training of staff, and this is continuing in many institutions. We are putting in, in place uh, the screening and other surveillance system that uh, was supposed to put in place. As, uh, as it has been said, we are going to respond bi-monthly uh, to the department. And uh, just, uh, I'm going now to 5.5, uh, uh, the issue of psychosocial support. What is coming forward is that our students are very anxious as well as our staff at the moment. Uh, Higher Health has uh, given us uh, um, some support uh, for counseling, uh, uh, which is available to all students. Some universities has, have established their own facilities. USAF and the South African Medical Research Council have embarked on a sector-wide survey aimed at producing data that would allow for evidence-based interventions uh, at campus level. 5.6, please. Uh, building a social compact. We realize that uh, all the public health uh, interventions, I'm on 5.6, all the public health interventions uh, will um, only work if uh, there is overall participation of students and staff in preventing the spread of the virus. This aspect cannot be policed. So it is therefore urgent uh, for us that we develop a social compact between staff, students and university administration to combat the spread of the virus. And then uh, I'm on 6.1, the next slide, please, which uh, speaks to the reconstitution of the academic year. Each university will reconstitute the academic year, as I've said, 
uh, it depends, this will depend on how each university began the academic year 2020. You will recall that some of the universities had a delayed start because of unrest on some campuses. This will depend on the trajectory of the pandemic going forward. It will depend on the start dates of each cohort of students. The academic year uh, usually comprises 27 to 28 weeks of academic engagement, which means that uh, the academic year 2020 will only realistically end in early 2021. As I move to conclude, uh, Chair, I just want uh, 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 to reflect uh, on some of the risks that uh, we've identified and which we have to keep an eye on as the institutions. Uh, the first one that we want uh, to mention, I'm on 7.1. The risk uh, that we want to, to highlight, and I think our colleagues from the TVET colleges have mentioned this, uh, the uncontrolled campus outbreaks uh, of COVID-19 which might flare up uh, due to a failure to galvanize a university student staff social compact on combating the spread of the virus, the failure to establish the necessary public health infrastructure. We are also facing financial risks, which are due to the 2020 subsidy payment deferment, uh, which, has, uh, re which is resulting in cash flow challenges for some of our institutions. There's a potential loss of tuition fees and residence fee income. There is unexpected expenditure that we are uh, making uh, on emergency learning needs, data devices, as well as public health interventions. Uh, these are financial risks that uh, we are watching. In terms of infrastructure projects, uh, several universities uh, had infrastructure to a halt during the lockdown. This has been because of the pre-lockdown deployment of heavy machinery. In level four, these were allowed to continue and the universities are busy now counting the costs uh, of uh, these delays and the, um, the amounts that we will have to pay in uh, penalties. Um, on, uh, I'm on 7.3. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, think, uh, wait um, the that, that's the last. Uh, uh, that's, uh, I'm moving just to the end, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, of course, uh, we, there's an issue of the potential uh, decline in subsidy funding for 2021, significant uh, in negative impact on the research funding a potential decline in absorption of graduates that we might be able to release to the economy, a lingering outbreaks of COVID-19 in the absence of a vaccine and of or, or treatment uh, protocols. The funding strategy group of USAF as well as the finance executives forum of USAF are developing a dashboard facility that will alert universities uh, to the key short-term and long-term risks, a conceptual document that plots out possible scenarios of a post-COVID-19 environment is uh, being developed. Uh, so uh, we, we are going to end it here, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, Prof, it's very important to, to look at your time when you are given time to present. If it's 20 minutes, it must be 20 minutes. It was 18 minutes, Chair. It was, well, it was way past 20 minutes from my watch. My apologies. Okay. <clears throat> it's fine. Let's proceed. Let's get to the, I will thank you very much, Prof, for your presentation. Can we get a, a sounds? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Chair. That. If you can, if you if you have pre prepared a presentation, just uh, you know manage it from your own screen. As you can see, Anela is struggling there. Uh, is it so enough? Can, uh, yeah, we can see it now. Yeah, okay. 
Okay. You have got 15 minutes, uh, President uh, of South. Okay. To take us presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to uh, greet you and uh, observe protocol as well in acknowledging others for the sake of time. Uh, I just want to make two important points as part of my introduction that uh, uh, the Department of Higher Education has been consulting students from day one since the announcement of the, of the lockdown and the, everything COVID-19 we uh, have been involved such that we are even in the ministerial task team to ensure that the views of students they find expression. So I think that we must commend uh, the Department of Higher Education for such an, a, a recognition uh, of the consultation of students. Number two, I want to uh, indicate that uh, we are pleased with uh, how some of our universities are going beyond uh, uh, expectation in terms of producing sanitizers, uh, producing masks, and a number of uh, uh, PPEs that are required. Uh, it's something that from the South African Union of Students, we are commending them for doing such a good thing. We are making these remarks because we are always seen as people who oppose and we don't acknowledge anything positive being done by either the department or by universities. And today we are acknowledging these positive uh, initiatives that are being done. So I want to say before we came to this meeting, uh, we consulted all the 26 SRC presidents and all of them, they made submission uh, on uh, uh, the measures being uh, implemented by universities and we used those submissions to compile this presentation so as i speak you must uh, be able to appreciate that uh, this presentation contains the views of students from all universities as submitted by all src presidents through south but as a, a way of a uh, background i uh, would not dwell much but you all know what covid 19 has done uh, to our universities and uh, you know the issue of existing inequalities between historical uh, disadvantaged institutions and the historically white institutions is highlighted by Yusuf already but as I continue the presentation we start to see the practicalities of those inequalities and I also want to say as a way of a, a, a background that uh, COVID-19 uh, also affected us as student activists. It's weakened student activism and led to postponement even of SRC elections. You would know at University of Forte elections are postponed. They were supposed to happen last month. At VUT elections were postponed. They were supposed to happen end of April. And uh, universities appointed interim structures. And uh, our fear is that as we proceed, because all other universities are due for elections in the next two months, universities might appoint uh, uh, people whom they control who will not be able to make them accountable. So COVID-19 has really affected us as student activists. And I thought I must make this point uh, uh, to be noted and perhaps to be uh, discussed going forward. And um, of course, it depends uh, issues of mental health and a number of issues uh, that you know how it has affected us. But my presentation will then uh, go into detail by starting with the first in return of students. Chair, uh, SRC members indicated that uh, universities are consulting them in terms of identifying the 33% of students. But uh, there are a few universities that uh, indicated that they are not consulted. There are only three. CUT, SRC said they are not consulted by their university. And I would want Yusuf to take note of that. UNISA did not consult the SRC. And uh, uh, what is also worrying is that University of Zululand do not even have SRC. Uh, there are issues there that I will explain if I had enough, enough time. But all other 23 universities consulted the SRC and we are quite happy that 
universities students are involved in identifying the 33 percent as outlined by the minister when he pronounced about the the, the first in approach i also want to highlight to this portfolio committee that uh, SRC members are also part of the COVID-19 task teams in their universities as well in preparing this phase in return of students. But then again, CPUT and UNISA is not in, including SRCs in their task team. So we'd want perhaps uh, if they are not listening to us, perhaps the portfolio committee right to CPUT and UNISA to ensure that students are involved uh, in the COVID-19 task teams. But I also want to highlight that the return of students has started in a lot of universities. And I've uh, mentioned the uh, Northwest University, University of Free State Vets, all the 33% of students are already in campus in these universities that I've mentioned. UJ, uh, Stellenbosch University, MUT, Rhodes, and uh, uh, UWC, NMU, UCT, they've already started as well. Students are receiving permits. They are starting to come to campus. Uh, but also, there are also other universities that are not yet in terms of the commencement uh, of the return of students. They have not started, uh, but they indicated when are they starting. I'm saying this, Chair, because uh, you would understand that the minister pronounced that when a level is starting, for example, level three is starting, uh, universities, right, will be, un universities will yeah. be given, there's someone yeah. speaking there. Yeah, hey, we still have a problem of uh, participants not muting their mics. Uh, I don't know who's that. Please just mute your mic. Okay, Chair, let me continue, but please add one minute disturbed by, by this uh, yeah. uh, member. Yeah. So I want, I, I want to say, Chair, the, the minister announced that when a level is, is commenced, universities are given two to three weeks to start phasing in students. Or, or for students to then be in campus. So which means that uh, this level three was announced to start on the 1st of July, and the expectation now is that on the 21st of, of uh, it was announced to start on the 1st of June, it means on the 21st, which is three weeks, would they then expect universities to have students, this 33% of students in campus. That is our interpretation of the announcement of the minister, unless we are wrong. So, but what we are saying now is that uh, University of KwaZulu Natal students will start returning on the 29th of June. Uh, UNISA said they are not yet clear, but University of Limpopo is returning on the 29th of June. Uh, SPU, uh, Soplanti, they are returning on the 26th of June. University of Forte on the 1st of July. University of Pumalang on the 29th of June. Stellenbosch University on the 1st of July, ETC. So those are some of the dates that SRC, to show that they are part of the engagement, they are even aware of the dates when students are returning. But then our worry is that some of the universities have not even issued permits because since the announcement uh, by the minister a week before the 1st of June, we uh, would expect at least universities to be somewhere in terms of preparations. But some of the universities have not yet issued permits to, the, to these 33% of students, and I have cited here uh, Water School University and University of Forte. Uh, there's none, not a single student of the 33 students have received the permit. So it's creating some sort of a, a worry, uh, considering that other universities are already far in terms of progress. Some universities, as I indicated above, already have the total 33% uh, in campus already. I want to talk about devices and connectivity. Uh, the SRC has indicated that uh, a lot of students are already receiving data and laptops. For example, we are told that at University of KwaZulu Natal, all first-year students have already received laptops. At uh, Soplat University, all students are covered in terms of laptops. Uh, UJ, UCT, VETS, NMU, Rhodes provided also laptops and data to a certain number of students and the Stellenbosch University, all students who requested laptops received them. Uh, and so it means that at least they, there's progress in terms of some of the institutions. However, most of uh, the universities have not provided students with data. For example, MUT students, not a single student received data up to today. 
University of Pumbalanga, not a single student have received data up to today, which is very concerning considering that other universities are progressing. We don't understand why others are not doing something to save the academic year as the motto we are moving with. But some of the universities also have not provided students with laptops. UNISA, University of Forte, CPUT, not a single student received laptop, even though in other universities we have certain percentages and cohorts of students that received. And in inadequate laptops and data, so in those other institutions that are providing, there is an issue of inadequacy. For example, at University of Limpopo, only 12,000 students out of the 22,000 students that uh, uh, that re requested laptops received the laptops, which is, means 50% of the students have not received. At Vest University, only 5,000 students were provided with laptops, and there are a lot of students in the missing middle who have not received their laptops. University of Free State, only 3,500 laptops were procured, which is a very small number considering that University of Free State we have got one of the rural uh, one of its campuses, one of the rural campuses, attracting a lot of students from the poor background. At UWC, only 50% of the students who requested laptops received them. The other 50% have not received. At Northwest University, some students are still waiting, and at Watersul University, 7,000 students are not yet sure if they will receive laptops. The next point that I want to make is that online learning have commenced in all universities. Uh, thus far, at UCT online learning, for example, it started on the 20th of April, uh, same with many other universities. But at University of Mpumalanga, the SRC um, took a stance that they are boycotting online learning until laptops and data is provided to all the students at University of Mpumalanga. So it's one of the issues I thought the committee must take note of so that we follow, follow up together on, on, on that. Connectivity remains a challenge for many students uh, because data distribution is very slow. So where, where data is being provided, is being provided at a very slow pace. At SOPLAD, for example, they were given in one of the months, and then but the last month they were not given. And then so there are all those inconsistencies that are happening and inefficiencies. And the, some of the sites, learning sites that are zero rated, they are not accessible. Students are finding difficulties to access those learning sites that are regarded as zero rated. Uh, you know, and I've, I, I've given examples uh, of where students are facing challenges in terms of that. I want to talk about health and safety measures, uh, Chair. So uh, we asked the universities to allow SRCs to return on the 1st of June. Some agreed with us, some did not. But I will highlight uh, up, uh, for now, later on, about that. Most institutions are ready for the return of students because the residences are, are undergoing deep cleaning and disinfecting. Uh, our SRCs that are encompassed are part of the process to monitor that deep cleaning and they, they've confirmed, 85% uh, of SRCs confirmed that really deep cleaning is happening uh, smoothly in campuses. Some universities would take students into compounds at 14-day quarantine. Invest, for example, University of Cape Town SRC told us that the university, you, you don't arrive in campus and just go to class. You will be taken into a 14-day quarantine and uh, before you are allowed to participate in anything that relates to the university. So which is very good. Other universities, I think they must copy that as well to ensure that there are no risks. Progress is slow in terms of deep cleaning at MUT. SRC is concerned there. And I also think that USAF and the uh, uh, parliamentarians can, mon uh, can take note of that as well. Uh, residence rules are being amended. We are happy with these amendments because we want uh, to ensure that students are not allowed to visit each other during this period because it might uh, uh, cause risk. They must also not receive visitors. So we don't want a situation where a brother come from home and visit a student at res, and we don't know what will happen with that interaction because this Coronavirus is really very, very dangerous. So cleaning staff that look after our students and resident securities, they have also been provided with PPEs. We are happy with that as well. More important is that universities are making their own PPT, PPEs. I made this point, but what is more good, Chair, is that students are part of the people who are helping in manufacturing of sanitizers and masks. Our students are deep inside uh, the university uh, engineering sites to help produce these things that are needed. So 
we are very happy with that 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 progress. I also want to say, uh, campus shuttles are also being uh, sterilized. Uh, libraries are being fumigated. Students with underlying conditions and comorbidities are not being forced to come back to campus, and measures are being put in place for them to finish their studies. Students who are returning are being screened thoroughly, which is very important. And the compulsory health protocols are in place in all the institutions. So generally, in terms of health and safety, students, if you look at this presentation, at least there is progress that we have noted from our side. But I want to make some recommendations, Chair. One of the first recommendations is that we think that academic exclusion must be suspended in all institutions, considering what is happening to the 2020 academic year. So Stellenbosch University have already taken that decision now in preparation for next year. That next year they are not going to exclude any student who was registered in 2020 because they understood that there is no student who brought corona. It's not out of their own making. Therefore, the challenges might affect the performance of students. So we're making this recommendation that all the other 25 universities must take this decision that has been taken by Stellenbosch University. We're also recommending that universities must allow all SRC members back on campus. I know that other universities have already listened to us, like Forte listened to us on this matter. I know that NMU listened, they have already given students permits to come back. I know that uh, CPUT is listening on this matter. I know UWC listened. Stellenbosch did not even chase away the SRC. So during the whole COVID-19, SRC members were allowed to remain in campus. But our, our concern, Chair, is that UCT and Watersville University, they are not allowing SRC members back. I think those are the only two universities. Can you please follow up and indicate why are they not allowing SRCs? Because SRCs are part of stakeholders who must be part of decisions being taken by universities in this difficult moment to ensure that uh, we manage uh, the crisis that we are facing as it relates to COVID-19. But we're also saying UNISA must be included in all these interventions. The SRC is crying that their students are excluded on a number of things. In fact, they are told that even when, when laptops are procured, UNISA students will not be given. So it's a, it's a serious issue that has been raised by the SRC of UNISA, and we thought we must present it to Parliament. For e-learning to thrive, Chair, universities must be more efficient in distribution of laptops and data to students. We also recommend a waiver of N plus two rule for the 2020 academic year. The same way we recommend the one for the academic exclusion. We also recommend chair reconfiguration of the fee structure because residence costs, uh, students are not staying in some of their residences during this period. So you find out that a student went home during the beginning of the lockdown in May, and that student must come might come back in August or September based on what has been mentioned in the first in approach. So during these six months, a student did not stay in res. He's going to be forced to pay for services that were not rendered to him or to her. So we think that the portfolio committee must provide guidance to universities in relation to that. Distance learning cost variations is an important matter because conduct classes cannot cost the same way as, as uh, non-conduct classes. So we think that the fee structure must be reconfigured uh, in our institutions of higher self-funded students also must be allowed an option to deregister their residences. For example, at NMU, we are told that uh, Comrade Mugabe, are you there? From home, you see. Okay, so, we missed. So, sorry, Chair. Yeah. Chair, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Proceed. Okay. Just wrap up, man. Your time yeah. is up. Okay. Okay. So, so coronavirus, I don't know what is happening with my presentation. Can you still see my presentation? Yeah, yeah. It's on the screen. I just... Uh, okay. Is this the last yeah. slide? Yeah, this is the last one. Okay, sure. There's, no, there is one after this one, but I will just brush it. Okay. So I'm saying, Chair, uh, cash-paying students are being denied an option to deregister. So when you are cash-paying students, but then you decide that you don't want to come back as part of this 33% or 66%, because there is that option that you can stay at home if you are comfortable. 
It means you are not going to stay in your race again till the year end. You must be allowed to deregister because you are going to pay for a raise that you are not going to use for the whole second semester. So we are saying students must be given an option to deregister. We are also saying uh, special cases that are being mentioned, let's monitor it together because some of the students are being denied even though they come yeah. from families that are difficult. Uh, like University of Mpumalanga, we are told 37 students are being denied. We have got special cases from their homes where they come from. And we're also saying students must continue receiving their allowances. I think that there is a clear point made here that allowance for NSFAS students must continue. But the University of Free State, some students are being denied their accommodation. In fact, all students in one of their campuses, they quack. At the University of Venda, students are complaining that the money for data is being deducted from their monthly NSFAS living allowances. It's not fair. MUT is discontinuing payment of allowance is a big problem. So we're also saying that investors might identify one residence as a quarantine facility. Why are we saying this, Chair? Because uh, uh, higher health is suggesting that a student might, must be returned home if he is found to be positive. We are worried that a student bringing back a positive status to communities is more risk than a university have more capacity to manage. So if a university identify one residence that must be used as a quarantine facility for students that uh, might and or work with provincial department of health in in the areas where the universities are located it's more better than to retain a positive uh, a student who's who found positive back home uh, chair i'll just rush towards the end now i think that uh, 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 the, the minister and deputy minister is there visiting universities and colleges. They must also take stakeholders with them uh, so that when assessment is being done, we don't think that they are biased, that institutions are ready whilst labor unions are not included and the students are not included. I say this because I have seen it in basic education. Kosas and, the, and, and Satu, they are now saying that uh, uh, universities are, are not ready, they must be, uh, they are now saying uh, schools are not ready, they must be closed. It means they were not in, involved in terms of the monitoring that, that, that must happen. So we don't want that to happen when Nehau or, or Ondeu uh, will start then to say uh, 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 universities are not ready. Even though ourselves as students were comfortable because we think that st students are better in residences than at home because at home they don't have facilities, they don't have connectivity, and online is continuing, and therefore we don't have any option. We think that the return of students is the better option, but it must be managed properly considering all the recommendations that, that we have provided uh, here. Lastly, Chair, I we want to recommend that this portfolio committee give time frames to NSFAS for, for the procurement of laptops to be expedited. We are saying this, Chair, and I want it to be put on record because we know uh, issues of procurement, how they delay, and the laptops might, might arrive in December uh, if, if there are no time frames that are strict, that NSFAS by this time, you must have concluded the process so that students receive their laptops, especially okay. NSFAS-funded students. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Comrade Mugabe uh, from uh, SAUS. Can we get a presentation from uh, Safet's working group? I must say, uh, Comrade Mugabe, your presentation was very helpful in terms okay. of understanding the institution-specific issues, because I think that's what we are more interested in. Uh, can we get somebody from Safetza? Uh, Safetza working group. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chairperson. Have you? Oh, okay, sure. <clears throat> All right. Uh, you are not that visible. Oh, yeah, you are now. Okay, yes, over. Yes, I'm still trying to upload the presentation. All right, 15 minutes. Ne? Okay, okay, thanks.
Uh, who's uploading the presentation? Is I'm the one. Okay, are you struggling? It's okay. Staying who, for years. who is doing what? Uh, who's going to talk to us? Just uh, I'm introduce the, yourself first. I must just introduce the presentation. No, introduce yourself. Uh, okay. Who are you? My name is Pio Kumalo from Machu Tivet College. I'm part of the working group that represent all SRCs in the Tivet sector. Okay. Okay, Spiwe. Uh, I think you just have to to sort out your your, your network connectivity. You keep on okay. breaking. Yeah, I think you keep on breaking. Uh, oh. Yeah, but we can hear you now. Just upload your presentation and talk to it. Okay, thank you very much. That's what I'm trying to do now. Check and I try on my side. Okay, try on your side, Anel. Spio, are you connecting on your cell phone? Yes. Uh, I'm using my tablet, actually. Your tablet, okay. I think if you are using the cell phone, you're going to struggle. Uh, Anele, help him there uh, with his presentation, and then he can just talk to it. Can you see, Chef? Uh, no, what's appearing here is a screenshot. Of, uh, of this meeting. Okay. Yes, sir. Anele, just uh, try and uh, get his presentation. Okay, sir. You are not winning. Hey, I'm failing, Chair. This thing is undermining me. Okay, Anela will help you to get your presentation on the screen. Okay, then you can just talk to it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think in the meantime, let me just take the. Oh, okay. It is, it is Chair. Yeah. It's yeah. to everyone. And uh, let me say all protocol observed due to time. We are all going through a difficult and unprecedented phase which has left us wanting for solution. The invisible enemy with no reference in history where we can draw lessons from that to find final solution, final and lasting solutions. This pandemic, however, ruthlessly exposed our weakness in transformation of the state. No one in this point in time, Chairperson, can ever claim to have faultless solution to the problem at hand. But collective effort and regular consultation will get us through these trying times. Next slide, please. Let me start by the problems we've been facing and also the integrated plans that have been made to ensure that students are being assisted in these trying times. We at Excelta has been engulfed with NSFAS issues ever since the NSFAS wallet or cell pack system that was rejected by universities was disposed to the civil sector. The system has always posed challenges post the pandemic and continues to do so. But however, Chairperson, we must acknowledge the system put in place in the form of NSFAS Connect to try and resolve other pending issues that have been facing students. Students have been facing issues of account that are being lost to such an extent that they could not be able to access, to access their allowances. So NS Fast Connect has been able to mitigate with students to try and launch cases such that their account will be unlocked. But however, Jefferson, this problem still persists because the system is not well that monitored. Students only receive case numbers 
but their accounts are not being unlocked. The students have been faced with exorbitant charges that were introduced, charging them 10 rand per withdrawal. These charges, Chairperson, they are more expensive than any other bank charges and seeks to exploit the very money that the student, they need the most. Next slide, please. The allowances of students, also Chaperson, have been recently been reversed while students have not yet been able to withdraw them. The issue of pending appeals have not yet been resolved as well, which we have a problem a number of students have not been able to access their allowances nor receive them. We hope if we can recommend as a committee to finalize and quickly ensure that all these pending appeals are being resolved such that students will be able to receive their allowances. The extension of Report 191, also known as 9 allowances of T1 and S1. Since trimester one students are gradually coming back on campuses without receiving their allowances, that will enable them to attend classes. If we can be able to ensure that the extension of allowances, so you understand that the number of days for trimester one student have been extended, but their allowances have been stopped. If we can recommend as a committee to ensure that these allowances continue to, to, to assist students see they are already back on campuses and they are continuing in their studies. There are NSFA students who appreciate all measures that are put in place try and assist them to control these academic activities. However, due to pressures that some students are facing, there are those who, who feel that they won't cope under these conditions and want to register. And therefore, we'll plead to the committee that we should provide means based on each case, on each merit of the case of the student to try and assist students to deregister, but without facing any financial implications, such that when this student they are able to come back and continue with their academic activities. They'll be allowed to do so without any financial exclusion. Next slide, please. E-learning has been one of the proposed plans in trying to save the academic year. From its initial proposal, the plan seeks to favor the haves while disadvantaging the haves not. The, the po it posed unfairly discrimination between those who stay in the suburbs with a high network reception and those in rural places with low network reception. We, however, hold a strong view that the e-learning method can only be effective when the, in the inequalities among students are being addressed. Next slide, please. Meaning that all students are at the disposal of a gadget that will enable them to access the system. That will bring us to, to the issue of laptop chaperson. In Tibet colleges, we have students, the number of students have not received any laptops. And we are worried about the procurement processes that are taking so, so long because students, they are being left behind and they want to access this system to so such that it will enable them and equip them. When exam, come, when exam time comes, they'll be able to excel in their studies and be able to, to perform academically. And the, the issue of data as well, because students were promised that they will receive data to try and assist them to do this online learning to ensure we don't, no student will be left behind and all students will be able to access study material online. So this data student, even a single student in most of the colleges, they haven't received data. So we are worried with the procurement of laptops and data that will act to try and assist students to study online. Next slide, please. We are also pickling from the chairperson with the issue of conducive student accommodation. This pandemic has exposed our inability as a sector to secure a conducive and a safe student accommodation for students. Students are being gradually sent back to the slaughterhouses, which are neither fumigated nor sanitized. These slaughterhouses are packing students in numbers in a manner that does not allow social distancing capacity. The lockdown regulation harshly affected informal trades, where majority of parents of these students relied on them, which left many students not being able to pay their rental fee during, to, during this phase. Now, the ruthless landlords that are accommodating these students, they find they have a nerve and audacity 
of keeping the belongings of students, not releasing these belongings to students, because majority of these students, their accounts were not paid. And when their rental account, the rental allowances are not paid, they haven't been able to pay their, their, their rental fees to such an extent that now these rooted landlords are not willing to release the belongings of students, nor are they wanting to accept students back in this, in this accommodation that students rely on while studying at the college. We therefore recommend that, next slide please, we therefore re recommend that the department and affected institution, they must liaise with local municipalities to try and force compliance in this accommodation. Because while we are dealing with ensuring compliance in our campuses, it must not just be the sake of ticking a box, but we must ensure, also ensure that our students are even safe off campus in the residence they are using. So if we can engage with these local municipalities to try and enforce compliance in this accommodation that are currently ac accommodating students. Let us also secure an alternative. Institution must engage or embark on a journey of trying to secure alternative accommodation that will give relief to the existing one. Because students are being packed in a group of 15 in one room, and it will not allow social distancing, and it will ensure that some students they, they get infected by this disease, and many of our students will get ill in this pandemic because the community that they are residing in does not allow for to self-isolate, does not allow social distancing, and many other things. These communes are not fumigated, nor are they being sanitized. So the moment if we can be able to force these compliances while we create another uh, or find another alternative accommodation, that will try and give relief to this student accommodation, which are minimal. That's why students are being packed like this. Let's also try to source us funding and create a relief pack to cover for those students who are unable to get their belongings due to the outstanding rental fees. Next slide, please. Campus status is teaching and learning. Majority of our campuses have met the compliance standards that is required while some are still behind. Children are being screened on daily basis at the gates and being sanitized. Spiwe, are you still there? Not yet. Yes, I'm still there. Okay. Pardon me. However, are not yet operational. Can you hear me, Chaperson? Yeah, you keep on breaking there. I think there's uh, some connectivity problem, but proceed. Eh? No, I'm fine now. Thanks. However, Chaperson, there are some campuses that are not yet operational which then poses a challenge to students being left behind. Because ours is to say, let's save lives, save the academic year, while we ensure that there are no students that are being left behind. They are students whom their temperature, when they are being screened in the gate, when the temperature is above 38, they are not allowed to access campus. And those, there are those students who are doing, who are doing the, the, the self-screening process, and when they receive the result to their phone, it will say you must self isolate Those students advise that they must not come near by campus, they must isolate while they seek for medical help wherever they are. Now, the problem is that if these students are being turned away, or if these students receive the results of saying you must self isolate these students will get left behind because they will not attend the surgeon that is being done on campus. Next slide, please. There are lecturers who are being sent back due to their screening results and makes many less decisions not to be conducted. There are cases that have been detected which cause some of the campuses to shut down, and which means there are most there, there are lessons or surgeons that are being lost in the process, while we understand that we shouldn't have minimal time on campuses to control their academic activities. We therefore recommend that there must be TV screens or alternative, alternative projectors per campus. That will, en that will enable lecturers to record their session and be broadcasted in class in the case where they cannot access campus. In the case where the lecturer comes into a gate 
and they receive the, the results that are more than 38 degrees and then they cannot access the campus or in the case where the lecturer is claiming that they have been in contact with a person who has been affected by this pandemic these lecturers must at home record the sessions and send them to school where in campuses it will be in the when the, the is the time for the session of the lecturer who's absent they will be able to play it through the screen or through the projector so the student will be able to capture up to the, the, to, to the session. Or let's try and ensure that we provide alternative peer tutors to ensure that in the absence of the lecturer, we are able to then ensure with the peer tutors come in and ensure the student are being covered on their list. Let's ensure that we record every session in class, such that those students who couldn't access campus can catch up. If we are able to then record lesson or, or record session in class, it will enable that the student that is being sent away from the gate because of their screening results or because of their self-screening or self-checkup, this student will be able to then, because this session will be recorded and will, will be uploaded for the student to be able to catch up. Next slide, please. In conclusion, Chairperson, there are no shortcuts, there are no easy answers, there are no complete formulas, only continuous engagements among the people with continuous response, response to their own activities, taking them a step forward each time, can lead us to our goal. And our goal, Chepesi, is to ensure that we save lives, we save the academic year, while we ensure that we leave no students behind. The other problem we've been facing, Chepesi, as we conclude, we as a community, we need to take a standing resolution of trying to ensure that we, we are able to establish a national tax team of SAFET because currently we are not coordinated and we do not have a single voice, such that this national tax team of, of all colleges will be able in this ministerial visit, they'll be able to go with the deputy minister to try and monitor all institutions and give a valid report to ensure that even at the college level, we are able to have a unique and a single voice that will speak on. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Spiwe. Uh, can I take hands for for members to uh, Honorable Kieti? Uh, who else? Uh, Honorable Lizzie, uh, Honorable Pozzoli, Honorable Boshoff, um, Honorable Notata, uh, in that order, Honorable Mananiso will be the last, I think. Okay, honorable members, uh, let's try and save time because <clears throat> the presentation did take uh, a lot of time. You know, even when we say you have got 40 minutes, you have got 20 minutes, you have got 15 minutes, our guest just keeps on uh, talking to us even when the time allocated is not completed. But otherwise, uh, let's try and have this engagement in the next um, 30 minutes to allow for responses from all the institutions uh, invited. I must say that I found the SAUS presentation to be very helpful because it takes us to institution by institution, which is what uh, from the side of uh, the portfolio committee when we issued the invitation. That's what we were expecting. Because we thought that we must move from the generality to the particularity, to the particular, so that we know what is happening in this institution, what is happening in that institution. Uh, I, the department was more general. I thought that uh, USAF was going to help us 
but also they were all general, you know, <clears throat> uh, and they left us uh, poorer in terms of understanding what are the issues in specific universities. But I think members will engage with that. I must say upfront that I am a bit disappointed because I thought that we'll get a sense of what is happening per institution, but we're still talking uh, principles, general issues. We're not yet at the level where we can zoom into institution by institution. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll determine what then should be done towards the end. Honorable Katie. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, well, I think let me also well welcome all the reports and maybe start with uh, a proposal, Chairperson, that maybe we should reconsider or consider this particular portfolio committee to go back to Parliament and uh, you know conduct its business inside Parliament physically because. Engagement of this nature, I think they are very important for us to not extensively deal with issues that are arising, as we have heard earlier on. And you would know very well that our committee is comprised of, uh, you know, mostly young people that could easily, you know, be much stronger uh, to face these uh, possibilities of COVID-19. We do not have too many old people in our, our committee. So I, I thought it is important that we should reconsider going to Parliament and hold this kind of sittings there. Because we are left with like a, a, a very few minutes, we are going to put questions across, there wouldn't be any sufficient time to respond. Number two, let me agree with the chairperson on, on, on how the, the USAF particularly and, and the department have, you know, comprised or, con, con, you know, conducted their, their their PowerPoint pre presentation, it was, it, was, it was not clear. It was not clear and it's not, it was not what we have expected. And I believe that this is exactly the same content we have had earlier on when we engaged with the department. You know, as you have said, chairs and the principals and whatnot. The, the question I will have directly to the user, I want to check if there is any comprehensive con consultation happening between the vice chancellors and you know your lecturers and the HODs because I can guarantee you now that there are so many lecturers who will agree with me that there's a big problem with the process of teaching and learning under these uh, current restrictions of level three or before the level three there's always been a problem they are highlighting that uh, they haven't seen any improvement in fact this goes back to the fact that uh, if we were to save the academic year then we will be saving a very bogus academic year where students wouldn't, you know, be taught properly. Uh, the South have highlighted the challenges with regard to the connectivity, and I think that is a question that is all over. Everyone is aware of that. And I'm very surprised that we are just speaking about it as if we are just reporting. Uh, you know, it's like it's not a big problem. Someone is, is unable to connect. Someone did not submit assignment. Someone couldn't write an exam. Could they like it's okay? I mean, we are still saving the academic year and saving lives at the same time. I think that is very problematic, Chairperson. And I feel like in the near future, when officials are given mandate to well, mandate to come and report to us, and we we had expected uh, X, Y, and Z. If they are not doing that, I think they must be stopped on the first slide or two because we have we would have engaged that particular report and. Uh, and we must be able to tell them right there to stop and then give us relevant information that we would ordinarily require. I want to stop. I don't want to speak about a lot of things. I wanted to highlight that the importance of us going back so that these issues are dealt with thoroughly without any, you know, a, a rushing of time. They won't respond now. I can tell you there, there, there were so many reports that you can think of. I think let me leave it there, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Lidzia. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, 
I'm not sure if um, you know I will be right to welcome the reports, uh, but these are the reasons why I think um, I might not welcome the reports, uh, especially from the department. Uh, and I agree with you that um, <clears throat> uh, Saus has actually assisted us a great deal with uh, um, being institution specific. On the 21st of April, we had a conversation with the department and we asked them to give us a detailed uh, or full details of this online learning thing. Um, we said they must um, undertake a survey on a ICT capabilities of these institutions. One institution at the time on the state of readiness of online learning. Again, on the 14th of May, um, we raised the same concern with, with the same department, uh, asking them to cover um, um, the state of readiness uh, before resuming online learning. <clears throat> and we said to them, uh, it's there, uh, even if you go to PM, PMG website and listen to the conversation, we, we said uh, what they were giving us were not accepting. We want them to give us a detailed breakdown of each institution, one institution after the other, uh, on this online learning. So I want to echo your words and that of Honorable Kate that uh, the department is really not assisting us. Um, um, and we, we, you know, we, we will or we might end up uh, agreeing that they are ready to go back, whereas we don't even know if we can account for each and every institution or each and every child or student in each and every institution. So I think, Chairperson, um, this is what we must do. We, maybe we must develop a format for them uh, to respond. If it's Vets University, uh, does the cha uh, a student have a laptop? Uh, yes or no, they tick. Uh, do they have internet connectivity? Yes and no. Do they, uh, yes or no. Do they have, uh, um, or do they stay in an area where they will be able to uh, study conducive? Maybe we must do those things uh, for them to respond to us institution per institution so that we can account for each and every uh, student as we have said. The basic principle we're putting here is that we don't want even one student to be left behind. <clears throat> um, on Tibet colleges, what is the status of online learning <clears throat> uh, for this branch? I I think I saw something, um, um, uh, Chairperson, uh, that looked very promising and very nice. Um, from um, from Khartsibande, uh, Tibet College. I think uh, the Deputy Minister even went there when they were launching um, uh, this thing. So what we saw there is that there's an, I think, an application of some sort that was, uh, you know, that they were launching uh, that will assist them with uh, uh, online learning and attendance and so forth and so forth. Maybe the uh, Aruna can assist us. Uh, if possible, maybe the department can assist all these other <clears throat> um, um, uh, Tibet colleges. Uh, maybe give them a link to those people to assist uh, these other institutions that uh, seemingly might be struggling. On uh, procurement of devices, Chairperson, I want to categorically state that uh, I don't support uh, any creation of monopoly of any kind, anyway. And therefore, I want to um, appeal to those who will be responsible for a uh, procurement of uh, the, these devices, laptops, laptops or whatever um, the case might be, that there must, there must be, you know, this, this if it's 200,000 or let's say 400,000 laptops, that must be procured. Um, um, as NSFAS will be advertising on Friday, 
It must look for as many providers as possible, of course, with the same specifications, uh, so that as many SMMEs can participate in, in providing these devices. This thing of uh, having one uh, a big company uh, providing 400,000 laptops, I don't think it should be encouraged at all. I think we must break it down. If one uh, SMM is providing 20,000 devices, if they have uh, capacity to do so, let's encourage that. It can't be that we must have one. I think on questions, <clears throat> as, th as these students and lecturers uh, return back to campus, are they tested uh, somehow or were relying on uh, this screening thing uh, of temperatures? And I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I know that in high schools and primary schools, we've had uh, quite a number of them closing down because, uh, uh, you know, one way or the other, we find out that one of the uh, teachers or learners has uh, tested positive or been uh, in contact with somebody been, uh, or who has been tested positive. <clears throat> Are we relying only on the screening and the screening questions that we see uh, from the higher health? What happens uh, when somebody actually is honest enough uh, to say they have been in contact uh, with somebody who have tested positive or suspected to, to be positive? Do we close the institution at all? or we just isolate until we get the results. Uh, can each Tibet and university verify, Chair, if uh, students um, have internet connection, or each each one of them uh, verify if uh, students have uh, internet connections? On Yusuf, I think this will be the last one, Chairperson. Uh, your slide number four speaks of closure of uh, universities. Um, due to COVID cases, uh, give us a, a clear breakdown of how many universities have closed down. Um, and, um, you know, per university, give us a breakdown of how many students have tested a positive here and how many lecturers or staff have, have tested positive. And I think, uh, Chairperson, in, uh, in closing, we must thank, uh, I think the students have assisted us a great deal. In, uh, in making sure that uh, we at least we have an idea of what is happening in the sector, uh, because this one's um, uh, the department and you have really not assisted us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Litsi. Honorable Pozzoli. Thank you, Honorable. Chair. Um, one, my main question is, why is it that UNISA is so far behind all the others when it is already a distance university? So you would think that it would be at the forefront of distance learning, that it, it should have been the first university out of the starting blocks. And it's very disappointing when you think of the number of students that UNISA has to find that it's not actually ready. It's not clear what's happening there. It's not clear how many students are, are, you know, need help. It's not clear why suddenly students need laptops when it's a distance university anyway, and it's, it's been managing without every student having laptops until now. I just don't understand the story with UNISA. And then my other question is, if your fees are going to be kept the same, even though the academic year might go through until April, how can that be afforded? Um, how can universities afford, and accommodation providers for that matter, afford to keep, to keep the student going and accommodation going on the same fee that has been paid for a 10-month year for what will now be a 16-month year? Um, I, I'm, I'm really at a loss when it comes to that. Can I just say, I'm not entirely in agreement with my colleagues who are so critical of the department's presentation, because if you look carefully in that presentation, you will see that they talk about, I think, 40 different criteria that each university was measured against and how far each um, university came in uh, meeting those criteria. Um, admittedly, we didn't have the kind of detail that the students give, 
Um, but I don't know whether the presentation was about monitoring the criteria or simply reporting to us what universities had said about their state of readiness was. And then I'm also not entirely um, in agreement with my colleagues about the student presentation because I, I found that Mr. Mugabe gives a hell of a lot of instructions to people. Most of his presentation was about how other people must do things. The minister must do this. The deputy minister must do that. The VCs must do this. Universities must do that. And parliament must do things. A lot of it was him telling us all what we must do. And I found that tone quite um, unsettling in a way, that I don't think that that is the point of a presentation to parliament um, to instruct parliament what it must do. Maybe you could request, but um, the, the, the tone of instruction I found um, objectionable. But on the other hand, the details about different universities and where and when they were succeeding and failing, I thought were very interesting. And I wondered whether those matched up with the department's statement that there were some universities that had applied for deviations from the criteria and, um, and, and one of them had not been accepted. And I wonder whether the universities that the department say, says have not fitted in with their criteria are the same as the universities that the students say have not um, succeeded, particularly Walter Sisulu and Fort Hare, which seem to stand out as two universities that don't seem to be doing particularly well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Pozzoli. Um, Honorable Boishoff. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll try not to repeat anything that uh, some of the previous colleagues had already said. I wanted to know about the universities from the department, the deviations that were applied for. How many, uh, were any of those de deviations uh, applied for to uh, open up sooner or quicker, or were they all to uh, open up slower? Um, uh, how exactly does that go, uh, or did it go? Then I want to know about the prevalence of uh, online lectures. Um, I know some students specifically said, uh, elect not to study through UNISA because they um, they are more auditive learners and uh, they they like having their lectures or their, their um, working material being supplemented by lectures, which uh, helps them to to master the the work. And uh, are the universities who actually um, went into um, broadcasting uh, or podcasting the, the lectures or are they, are they all presented just on paper, just the, the lesson plans, if, it, if one uh, wants to put it like that. Um, then on the community education uh, sector, I, I would just like to echo what uh, the gentleman said, and that is that there's a, a dire lack of investment in that area, and that it is a, a problem because uh, they, there's every day a little bit less money. So I, I'm a little bit, um, uh, you know, pessimistic about that being rectified anyway, uh, anytime soon. And then um, maybe I could just a little bit uh, link to what uh, Professor Bazzoli said and what um, uh, well, Aruna is always uh, named on her first name, so I forgot her, her surname now. Uh, but what she has mentioned that the demand culture is not helping us in any way. And uh, I think that's a, it's a very, very central part of the crisis we have to deal with. We had a, a crisis with the demand culture uh, stopping institutions from opening, and then it was vastly amplified by the COVID crisis. Uh, that's just as a, a, a side. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Boshoff. Uh, Honorable Notada. Uh, not that are you there? Thank you so much, Chair. Can you see me in my audible chair? Uh, yeah, we can see you. Uh, shoot. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Chairperson. I think, um, firstly, let me just uh, thank everybody for their presentations. 
Uh, I just wanted to start with the Deputy Minister uh, quickly, Chair. I just wanted to check, uh, Deputy Minister, whether is the work of the Ministerial Trust team done at this point in time, or are they still continuing? Secondly, have you uh, in the Ministry with the, the Minister engaged uh, the Ministry of Communication regarding the spectrum? Uh, and then lastly, I think you should take some of the suggestions that have been brought forward by students uh, to um, involve stakeholders in your oversight visits and might be very helpful to get a full picture of what's happened. Then uh, I want to go into uh, the, the details, uh, starting for, with the Department of Higher Education. Um, can I just check whether has there been feedback regarding the capabilities uh, of or the online capabilities per institution broken down? Um, because that will also help us in doing our planning moving forward for our APPs as we would want to digitize the classroom uh, based on the fact that this uh, particular pandemic has shown us that we need to start doing things like that. Secondly, um, having learned from basic education as well, that there are some zero rated sites that are actually not functional. Has there been an analysis of functionality of these zero rated sites? Uh, because I know they, you know, in ICT, they would do an analysis of whether they, these sites are being utilized and how many people are using them, what's the traffic, um, has there been an analysis of that? And if not, can we please request one? Um, to USAF, uh, the Department of Higher Education as well. Um, regarding the missing middle, what assistance has been given regarding the missing middle, uh, whether it is devices or any form of support? As I would know when I was traveling in the beginning of the year, all these institutions, you know, uh, these learners were registering, these, these students were registering um, with, um, uh, with, uh, you know, being registered without having to pay a down payment. Obviously, you know, they, they're in the missing middle. So what support has been given to them, not necessarily and as for students. Then to the TVET and university branch, uh, USAF and unfortunately NSF is not here. I wanted to check on whether a breakdown of whether all students have devices, if that analysis has been done in these institutions. Um, and um, when will each student be confirmed to have a device? as per the criteria that has been set out, whether it's an NSFOS student, whether NSFOS is procuring it, or the department is procuring it, or the institution is procuring it. I think we need to get guidance in terms of that. Um, and then with the USAF, who is prioritized on the 33% of students that are supposed to go back to campus? Is that based, is that uh, left to each and every institution? Uh, or do we have a particular criterion that you use as a guideline to assist in terms of that. Then uh, my last uh, few chair is that um, um, upon, uh, upon arrival of, of learners, I've recently been to Makawula Senior Secondary School in Mount Frere, which is my constituency, um, where over 200 people have been tested positive uh, for COVID-19. And, and the, the biggest issue there was the fact that it, there was negligence uh, particularly in the managers of, of these uh, schools where the learners that came from different parts of the province were not being tested uh, when they returned to the hostel. So to use to the to the department, uh, specifically the Tibet branch, the students that are returning back to residences, are they being tested? Not screened, are they being tested? Are they being quarantined for 14 days? because they can come from different parts of the country. So you know, you might not know what they come with. So if you can just give guidance, guidance in terms of that, whether they've been quarantined for 14 days, are they being tested before they even interact uh, with anybody that is on the campus at this particular uh, time to avoid something that I've seen at the moment. And then the last question, the second last question, Chair. USAP, the last, uh, is, let it be the last. Uh, Yusuf, is there a... <laughs> okay, Chair. Um, Yusuf, um, I wanted to get a view of you in terms of academic exclusion versus applications versus the intake, considering that the academic year has been extended, has there been a plan in place uh, in terms of that? The comment I was going to make, Chair, was that we need the recommendations made by both Safeta and, uh, and, and the Union uh, and SAUS so that we can be able to actually give to the department and actually use up to, to kind of look at that and see how deep how much detail we actually require when we actually do these meetings and for the tbit branch to consider the proposal about video recorded lectures at the tbit sector okay. thank you so much chair
Thank you very much, Honorable Mananiso. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, let me firstly welcome all the presentations. And one must note that I've been covered by Comrade Tebuho, yourself, and Comrade Kietze. Uh, I would want to speak on uh, uh, Arona on the issue of demand culture. I think on this one, it was not fair for Tibet to be told about that on the basis that the minister has made a commitment that uh, they will procure these particular devices. So we, it can be correct that when we have to serve our people and save our people, we start now uh, putting such weddings. So it, it, it was not comfortable for me as a public servant that I would hear that there's this demand culture. Uh, the other thing, Chairperson, is with regards to what Temoko could have said on issues of specific with... Uh, accurate information. I mean, now we cannot zoom uh, in terms of the indication of major MOOC or what, who's struggling so that we are able to intervene. So I, I believe we would need as well to submit that particular uh, questionnaire or guideline document that would indicate what is it that we are looking at as something that needs to be done so that we are able to quantify and confirm that uh, uh, we are ready to for this particular phase. Lastly, Chairperson, uh, one of the things that one must note is on the issue that at least now, we know that all actors in this particular sector, they are part of all these particular processes. However, we need to make sure that we take uh, their safeta recommendation of making sure that they become included in all these uh, uh, discussions on the ministerial task team. And uh, Chairperson, Lastly, it's on the, the, the participation of uh, the, the, the police sector to say, with this phase, what would be their relations with the Department of uh, Education, uh, Higher Education and Training uh, as much as the higher health is involved? What is the involvement of this other particular sector? Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Ananiso. Um, we don't have much time for the for the responses, but I'm just gonna be very brief. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> I think there are just few quick points. Uh, uh, maybe let's make a plea to all the universities to allow the SRCs to be part of the COVID test team uh, to prepare for the returning back of the students because. They are the key stakeholder in the university. Um, <clears throat> I I read about uh, Univen. I was not sure whether it's true that Univen is deducting uh, from the NSFAS allocation uh, to uh, fund for data to to procure data. I think if that is true, then we've got a big problem. Uh, I think we might have to get some specifics from the university as to is that true or is it not true. Uh, <clears throat> but I think the issue is, uh, and I hear um, Honorable Bozoli, this is the third interaction that we are having on the same subject. Uh, we have had two engagements with the minister and the department. And I think in both those engagement, we've always been insisting that let's get to have a sense of what is happening per institution. Uh, let's let's now no longer deal with the general. Let's deal with the specifics, university by university. And I think that that call we've made it in the past, and uh, it has always been our expectation that when we receive this one we will then get a sense of what is happening at UCT, what happening at the University of Limpopo, what is happening at the uh, uh, CPUT, for instance, so that we get a sense of where the disparities, because we must also understand that there are huge disparities uh, in the system. Uh, there are universities that are far ahead, there are universities that are lagging behind. But that you can't determine and establish unless you get given the status institution by institution. 
which is what we requested, which is what we're expecting to get today. The last time Yusuf was not there, we said maybe let's brought in Yusuf, let's bring in Yusuf so that we can get to understand directly from the, from the association that represents the vice chancellors. But we did not get what we what we we anticipated and i think that it's only going to be fair that uh, we have a follow-up session where we can get this information about what is happening <clears throat> uh, now that is my first point and i think uh, uh, I, I don't think it's something that has, has, has it's it's a request that was not understood because we did that the first time and the second time, and I think the minister in the second engagement did did say that I'm going to try and get this information because uh, he has been struggling, he has been a bit frustrated, but now we are told the information is not is there. So I think what is important is that it must just be given uh, to us so that we understand what is happening. The second point I think that I would like to raise is on the issue of the procurement of uh, the gadgets, the laptops. And I don't know whether is there any rap from NSFAS in the meeting. Uh, Prof. Dr. Carol Lesson, are you in the house? Because we always invite, they always participate. Uh, so that we should be able to speak into the institution directly that handles this matter. So Dr. Carolison is not is not connected this time around. Okay, so there is nobody from NSFAS. Uh, but <clears throat> but I think I must take this opportunity to express my dissatisfaction with the the pro the 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 um, lack of progress uh, on this matter. Uh, it's an issue that we raised in the past to say, please, the acquisition of the laptops is a very key component of the of the approach of a uh, multimodal uh, remote learning systems, uh, which is was supposed to start at the beginning of this month. So now there is lots of delays which are unexplained. We know there was a task team, now it's a back to NSFAS. So all what I wanted to say to plead with the NSFAS is to uh, accelerate that process of uh, procuring the laptops. Of course, do it within the confines of the law. Don't uh, <clears throat> comply fully with what the requirements of supply chain management are, but please make sure that as soon as possible, we don't expect any further delay in this matter. Uh, and the laptops gets given to the students. Students are frustrated because uh, they've been promised the gadgets. And it's not that money is not there, money is there, but the process is just delaying. Uh, of course, uh, I think the point that Honorable Litsia is, is, is mentioning around empowerment, uh, broad-based black economic empowerment, uh, that is a matter that has to be factored in by NSFAS. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think generally those are the issues. But for me, the important thing is to understand, you know, we keep on talking about a huge disparities but until we get presented with the reality institution by institution is then that we can have a, a grasp of uh, what really are we talking about and what type of interventions are required uh, so in that respect i think that's how i feel that uh, that the presentation by yusuf and the department were very disappointing uh, in a sense that they did not meet the expectation that uh, we have and we've communicated this expectation. But otherwise, there's still some time left. 
I'm going to ask everybody else just to summarize, uh, starting with the department and then Yusuf, uh, and uh, probably uh, Saus, there's a specific question to Saus. Uh, I I think the DG is in the house, DG. Or uh, should we start with the DM, or we should end with the DM? Uh, Maybe let the DM. Okay. DG. No, th th thank you very much. Just see briefly. Uh, I think the comments and the assessment in the overall that. Uh, the honorable members are making uh, are really welcome and uh, appreciated. Uh, what then we're seeking to do, uh, Chair, uh, perhaps together with the USAF, we're not necessarily looking at the critique or critiquing each and every institution in respect to uh, the areas perhaps that uh, are still requiring attention. What we're doing, uh, taking into consideration from the previous uh, presentations to this portfolio committee, we categorized institutions about uh, their need of assistance, whether it relates to resources and other forms of assistance. And in that respect, Chair, we have then been working with each and every institution into ensuring that one, all structures that are required in so far as ensuring that the health of everybody in an, an institution is actually taken care of in respect to the prescripts of uh, the Department of uh, Health. Uh, facilities, equipment, at those details uh, in respect to saving the academic year what infrastructure what systems are we putting in place what processes and what then which became important chair if you would still remember it was the question of addressing the unevenness through making available the resources hence working uh, quite in detail with each an institution, uh, also interacting with the National Treasury at the same time, with a view of reprioritizing funds, because there is no new money in all what we are talking about. It's just about how do we reprioritize funds to be able to confront the challenges of COVID-19. We did that with each and every institution and sought approval of the minister so that they can be able to acquire everything which is required, which that has actually happened. There are still few gaps here and there. So then all those structures, systems, uh, processes, and also the advancement of higher health services in working with institutions uh, to improve and perfect uh, working into complying with all what the Department of Health is actually uh, prescribing. All those things have actually happened. Now, what then uh, is coming from the view of students is the question of, as recipients of all these services, how far institutions have actually gone, which is a testimony in respect to the work that we have undertaken together with institutions into ensuring that everything is put in place. And few institutions that are still having challenges were attending to those. And even this one of SRC is coming back. South raised this matter, and we engage with each and every institution. The response chair is quite enormous. Even the two institutions that are mentioned that SRCs have been come back as yet. Those management in, the, in those institutions are working on this matter. They've already agreed. So we're not actually intending uh, to uh, raise some of the few challenges that we are working with, with institutions which are actually in place. The MUT matter is a, is a separate one uh, in the sense that 
There are governance challenges, as the chair may be aware, and the vice chancellor has been suspended there, but we came in handy to work with both council as well as management into ensuring we mitigate the disruptions, you know, the best we can in that respect. So, Chair, please okay. rest assured, we take into consideration the concerns that you are raising in this respect. Uh, my colleagues will just come on some of the few issues. Uh, otherwise, we take quite seriously the comments that, Chair, you are making together with the, uh, your committee, honorable members. Uh, will work and improve. And uh, when you go there, I wish the chair takes the visit, you know, himself, uh, so that you can find what we are doing, what we're talking about, not being reported by us. We created that uh, situation so that we are comfortable when you are, get the, when you are getting there. You are screened, the chair, you are sanitized yourself, and you go through the institution quite happily. Thank you, chair. Thank you very much, chair. Uh, Maybe let's just take the DM now uh, in view of type constraints you are having. Uh, in the meantime, the, the presenters who presented the technical details have noted the questions. We can then uh, get a detailed responses later. DM. Oh, okay, thank you, uh, Chairperson. I think first, just quickly run down some of the key questions. The, the work of the task team is not done. Um, the task team serves at the behest of the minister, it's the ministerial task team. And I think he will then determine as and when, uh, you know, the duration, uh, the work and everything else of the task team is done. Um, so, so we are uh, still continuing to work. And then the we, Safetza, we have a representative on the task team from the Tivet College uh, students. So I think, you know, they'll just have to sort it out so that we know who represents who, what, how, and all of that. Um, and then stakeholders on oversight, yes, um, I fully agree. Uh, I actually, when I went to the University of Limpopo and to the Capricorn Tivet College, we had some of the students and the unions and everybody else were part of the team and I think we'll uh, also together advise the minister that, uh, you know, we include stakeholders in those engagements. We are engaging with communications um, in terms of the spectrum. I think it's a national issue beyond our, our department. And, and then the final issue, um, two, well, two issues. The one is, I think we just have to, uh, you know, it's a discussion we'll have to have with the minister and the DG around this report that the committee wants, because I think it's a, uh, you know, it's a fair request and we'll, we, we have the information and we, we, we just have to ensure that the, the information is provided to the, uh, to the portfolio committee. And then the last one, we, we must always emphasize that the intervention we're making uh, is not a device-based intervention uh, or it's not a device-based studying uh, mode of intervention but that it's a multimodal uh, 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 intervention uh, that supports learning and teaching uh, and therefore the qu question of devices is just but one of the interventions uh, and and i think that that emphasis is important to chair because with or without the devices learning and teaching uh, is uh, taking place. And just one example, I mean, when I went to the University of Johannesburg, part of the things that they're doing beyond sending the devices is to try and get students who are in far-flung areas to be part of the 33% that gets back to, uh, you know, to, to campus. And in that way, uh, you know, the device, therefore, doesn't become an issue. So, so I think that that emphasis is important, but we, we do take the points of the chair and share your sentiment that is quite worrying that uh, there are delays uh, and that the NSFAS is aware that uh, they need to make uh, that intervention. And probably, uh, you know, in, in, a, in future engagements, I think we may want to get a report on that. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Comrade Deputy Minister. Um, uh, Yusuf, a minute. Mm -hmm. Well, let's Listen, make it. Uh, Chair, I'm going to request uh, Professor Bauer to respond to the questions. Thanks. 
thank you. Bro. Thank you, Chair, and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I, I just want to respond to three questions. The first one is that uh, I think that there's a um, kind of misconception, you know, that we were going to complete the academic year through this online emergency teaching that has been going on. There's no possibility of that. The universities were simply not prepared. Uh, the, 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 the pandemic really threw us off course. Uh, uh, although there was a lot of e-learning going on on our campuses, uh, the universities were simply not ready to shift gear and to complete the academic year with online learning. So, and that is the reason why the universities have all agreed that every student will have a chance of completing the academic year by reconstituting the academic year, by ensuring that students will have face-to-face -face engagement as the as the trajectory of the pandemic changes. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly, 33 and a third of the students will be back on campus now. Uh, the 33 and a third of the students in the residences will be back. Uh, and of course, we are hoping that by the time we get to mid-July or something like that, that there'll be additional students coming back. So the, the, the point is really that we will have to reconstitute the academic year so that every single student has a chance of completing the academic year. So I, I think that we must not have the misconception that uh, online learning is going to be the way in which we complete the academic year. It's not going to be the way that we complete the academic year. That was the first point I wanted to make. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was that um, uh, all the universities have received uh, the guidelines for preparation for the return of students. All universities have uh, received the checklist. All the universities have their own preparations for the... And, uh, you know, and the, 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 the fact of the matter is that uh, in the 20 minutes that was allocated to us, what we were asked to do was how are the universities preparing for the return of students? And that's what we did, uh, Chair. Uh, we, we responded to that question. So, um, so I just want to make clear that the data that you are asking for uh, is, first of all, is a tremendous amount of data. Uh, but secondly, that the department does from time to time receive feedback from the departments, from the universities, indicating the level of preparedness. Uh, and that data is available, as the Deputy Minister indicated, that data is available. Uh, so it's, it's not a question of saying that, you know, that we're not collecting, that, student, that universities are not preparing and so on. The third point I'd like to make is that uh, I really appreciated uh, Mr. Mugabe's uh, input today. It was very useful. But I also want to indicate that it's, it's, one, it's, one, it's one side of the story. You know, there, there might well be other sides of the story. For example, some universities have decided to reopen later because they felt they needed the time to prepare. Um, uh, others uh, opened earlier because they were in a, in a, in a, in a position to open earlier. So I think that um, I've, you know, uh, 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 the president of South has sent me his presentation, and uh, we'll certainly work through that presentation and talk to our vice chancellors and so on about the issues in that doc in that document. Uh, okay. But what I want to emphasize is that um, all the universities are working towards uh, towards preparation. And what I would suggest, uh, uh, Chair, is that uh, it might well be. Uh, you know, following what the DG just kind of mentioned, it might well be, uh, the, the best option might well be for members of the portfolio committee to visit campuses and to really engage with the, what is going on on those campuses where there are concerns. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much Prof. Uh, we don't have time now for President of Saus Mugabe. Maybe just in a minute, Mugabe. Yeah, th <coughs> thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I wonder, two issues were raised to South, and uh, the one of UNISA, perhaps it will be solved when SRC is involved in activities happening there going forward. That's why that's how I will just deal with that. But the second issue that was raised to South is an issue of uh, our, our recommendations. And I think that uh, in the presentation, we prepared 17 recommendations, and I only talked of five because of time. So I think that uh, the presentation is sent to Anele. I've just sent it now so that he can share it with Professor Bozoli and others to see that these are recommendations. They are not demands. Uh, we don't demand. Our duty is to help parliament with the proper information. We don't even have funding for research, but we are able to come up with the proper information 
for parliament to be able to make decisions. So I think that the presentation must be shared uh, to all the members so that they are able to see okay. as we prepared. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President uh, of SAUS. Um, <clears throat> I think that's how I also understood the presentation to say, help us here, help us there, help us there, because uh, the students do not have the means they can only um, you know appeal to those who have got the means and the resources to assist that's how i understood it uh, your submission but i think thank you very much look for now it's not possible given the uh, the current situation in the country for us to go visiting institution uh, because we may be in violation of the lockdown regulations. So the issue of visiting may be limited and, and all of that, but it's not something that we would like to uh, to do at this stage. <clears throat> Look, if the information is available, let it be presented to us. We asked to understand what is happening in the system institution by institution. Uh, if the information is available, let it be properly packaged. If we need more time, communicate with us. We can apply for additional time in Parliament so that we get that information. Because I can tell you the only way to, to have a sense of the disparities that exist in the system in terms of completing the 2020 academic year is to look at this institution institution by institution. If you talk in term, general terms, you are not going to be able to have a sense of what is happening. So, and hence that has always been our request. And we're still making that request. Please do that so that we can have a follow-up engagement. Let's understand what is happening. What are the issues? The fact that the data is, uh, is, is too much does not mean that it's not possible for that data to be distilled in a form that it can be uh, <clears throat> presented to us and uh, we understand that. So, but yeah, I think uh, we will definitely need a follow-up engagement so that we do this thing that we said we needed to do uh, with the institution. Uh, but I must thank you very much. It was, uh, it was very helpful uh, for that. But you know, uh, I think we have been engaging on this subject uh, to an extent that we understand what the issues are now. Uh, that <clears throat> the issue of uh, gadgets are part of the multimodal uh, system of learning and teaching. It's not a panacea for all the problems or that are existing now or around online learning and so forth but it's a critical component of that because is physical um, allocation of study material to the students uh, is this remote learning in the form of uh, online learning and other means that the department has articulated so we know about that thing so I don't think we are moving from a position of ignorance, uh, which seemed to be an, an, a very implicit suggestion that uh, was made here. We understand what the issues are, but as we say, we want to have a sense of what is happening in the system. <clears throat> I think with that, uh, honorable members, thank you very much for your engagement. Our comments have been noted. The specific questions that we've raised, I think, Anela will follow up with the department and uh, all those who made presentation to get responses. We'll definitely schedule a follow-up engagement when we come back to look specifically into this aspect because that's that's a, that's what we are interested in. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much uh, to the student leadership. There is an issue of uh, MUT that we have noted, we are working on that. We are trying to establish the information what is happening there about the Vice Chancellor and uh, 
and the chairperson of council who are at each other's throat. Um, we will come back to that matter when we when we come back. Otherwise, members, uh, Friday <clears throat> uh, we we are having a briefing, one and a half hour meeting, just to deal with the the framework and the approach to the inquiry that we are going to do, and then we need to finalize some minutes and some reports. So we're supposed to start on Friday, but uh, with the inquiry, but we had to postpone because uh, we needed to put in some systems in place. But we are going to receive that briefing on Friday for one and a half hour. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much, honorable members and everybody who attended. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before the meeting, the, before the meeting is adjourned, let's wish Liverpool well. Uh, they are playing now at Korapas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next meeting will be early next year. <laughs> I'm glad Mugabe is using no student left behind now.